Welcome to DAX Machina. Join us as we explore the mysteries of this world. Cryptids, monsters, macabre tales, and horror stories abound. Could they be true? Are monsters real? Good evening, folks, and thank you for joining us for another edition of DAX Machina. Uh, Steve is working on, on Wednesday night. Hopefully he'll be back with us this Saturday night. And Doc has orders packed to have to be packed out of the uh, out of the shop. So it don't look like Doc's going to be able to join us tonight. Uh, so just, you know, keep those guys in, in your thoughts. You know, both of them are, are working and we want them both to be back safe with us this coming Saturday. But uh, you tonight you're going to have me and my my almost twin brother who's got a little more gray than me. Uh, well, that's only because I die mine. But hey, what the hell? <laughs> I can't tell you what to use, man. It does a good job. I don't look like a 70-year-old man anymore. But uh, me and Robbie Rip Reigns will be entertaining y'all tonight. So we'll give a big warm welcome to my brother from another mother from South Crackalacky. Robbie, how the hell you doing, brother? I'm doing good. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I heard you had a busy day at work today. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I said, I just, you always know it's going to be a good day when your first call is a well-being check that turns out to be, hmm, he's not doing so well. Day four call, never fun. Yeah, and it just went downhill from there. Well, you know, at least you're here now, so. Yeah, yep, then work tomorrow, and then I got the week, well, I'm supposed to have the weekend off, but I'm supposed to, I got to work Saturday during the day for the other corporal who can't seem to take his time off with with his days off like everybody else can. So I'm having to switch days with him. So oh I work Saturday and be off Monday instead of being off Saturday. So lovely. Yeah. I have an interrupted weekend. That's always fun. That's why I always yeah. hated split shifts. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. Nothing done on days you get split shifts. Thank God I, I don't have to do that crap anymore. Hopefully, eventually, one of these days I'll be there. I'll get there. But. Well, you, you, you're you getting there, brother. Well, I mean, I've already got the time, too. It's just I was stupid. You, you know you the story. Time in. Yeah, I got 26 and a half in already. Speaking of busy days at work, you uh, damn near went viral with that, that uh, video you shot of the uh, of uh, Trump's motorcade. Yep. 404. Like 404.8, 404. I think, is the last. Holy last crap. Set. That's yeah. a lot of views, man. Yeah. I was like, when it started, because there, I it, when it first started going that way, I is like every time I refreshed, it was like a hundred more views, and but it's still going up because this morning it was at four hundred, well, yeah, four hundred, and it's up to four hundred and four point eight by the end of the day. So I mean, it's still going up. That that's pretty freaking cool. I mean, it's just one of those one of those uh, right place, right time kind of things. I mean, you know, God, I wish I could, I could, every video I put out would hit that algorithm like that one did. Oh, yeah. There, you just can't you can't duplicate that kind of lightning in the bottle. That was just a lucky strike of lightning, like winning the lottery, and then, bang, it just blows up. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Robbie's a TikTok star. <laughs> At least he's not an OnlyFans star. Yeah. Uh I, I would only only have one fan probably, and it's the one that blows air on you. <laughs> uh, uh, I thought about like me. I uh, falls back falls falls back to the old uh, Bartlett pear joke. Yeah, I can start a new <laughs> one called Only Pans and uh, show me cooking and show how I build this table muscle here. Hey man. Food porn is always a always a high price, high commodity. People love yep. watching watching good good cooks and good food. <laughs> Tomb says Robbie, we're getting a TikTok dance. <laughs> Robbie, don't dance. Scooting boogie for anybody. Uh, you you remember the scene in uh, Urban Cowboy where? And I hate to compare myself to John Travolta or John Revolting, but where he's in the bar, leaned up against the bar, would. With the beard, that that's me. I I don't dance. I lean up against the bar and watch. Somebody is that <laughs> funny, Marty? Want to sign your hat? 
Yeah, if you want it ruined with somebody writing on it, because that's about as much as my signature is going to do for anybody is ruining whatever I sign. I'm sending somebody a message real quick. Eric Testman says, I need a cryptid TikTok. That's actually not a bad idea. Maybe we ought to think about something like that. Yeah, I do them uh, both as TikTok and as YouTube shorts, like little three minute videos on different things. Yeah, I that's think a, there's there's a one or two that I've seen that actually do that. So maybe we could maybe that's that's, that's not a bad idea. idea, Eric. I've got that DSLR camera now. I can probably shoot some pretty high quality short videos. Hmm. Hang on, I gotta. Do something. Sorry. Oh, yeah. How's it Just going? Moment. Yeah, Chris says she's gonna have me slime the blondes and booze banner. Yeah, but so is everybody else. So it's not like that's anything special. At least my signature is not anything special. Put it that way. Well, I don't know, Mister Four Hundred Thousand Views on TikTok. You're a celebrity now. No, my video is a celebrity, not me. <laughs> uh, well, be that as it may, you know, uh, you, you, you're you still doing some doing some pretty cool stuff, brother. And I'm proud <laughs> of you. Try. If my if my earlier woodworking videos on TikTok would take off like those would, that would I would be happy. Tammy Schnedler says, "What's what's top of tonight's topic, boys? Well, we're going to be talking about." werewolf slash dogman kind of encounter stories from world from the from the era of world war ii uh that happened both during and around world war ii and i think some of these are pretty compelling um i'm one in particular stands out above above the others for me and uh i think yeah i think you guys are will agree sorry i'm sorry i have kind of distracted my it never fails. I get online, my Facebook Messenger blows up. I, I start getting like 25 messages. If I don't get back to you in a, here in a minute, just just kind of bear with me because I'm I'm, a, I'm one of those uneducated hillbillies, or I I can't really focus on too many things I, like a shiny. I focus on one and lose track of the others, so I I can't answer the messages and talk. I'm like walking and chewing bubble gum, I can't do that either. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll bear with me on the messages. I'll try to get back to your messages as quick as I can. So have to give me a minute. We're going to we're going to start out the night talking about an, a, 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 a incident that happened in Finland in 1939. And I find this story rather chilling. At the beginning of World War Two, when things were just starting to heat up in Europe, Russia, for whatever reason, decided they were going to make a land grab mainly because of the Kola Peninsula, uh, where they where they still to this day have a have major naval yard. Uh, I believe it's called Polyarni on, on the Kola Peninsula. Uh, but they made a major push for land because they shared the Kola Peninsula with Finland. They pushed into Finland, and uh, the World Court even said, hey, you have no justification for invading Finland. Uh, the Russians were definitely the bad guys. And kind of like happening somewhere else over in that area, I, I wouldn't know... Uh, Something happened with Russia invading and just unjustifiably invading a country over in that area. I, I don't know something something current events wise. Yeah. You can draw your own conclusions here, but much like in that sounds incident, vaguely familiar. Sounds vaguely familiar, but much like in the modern day incident, Russia started out getting the crap kicked out of them. Little bitty Finland was putting up a much bigger fight than the Russians expected. Uh, they fin, the Finns were putting a they had to put in the whoop to them. Uh, in fact, one of the greatest snipers of all time, Simo Hayek, emerged during that was going to win as the Winter War. It's believed that during that conflict, Simo Hayek killed in excess of 500 Russians. Is that the one Enemy at the Gates was based on? No, no. That, that was a, a Russian and a German sniper counter. Uh, counter okay. that, was a base, that was based on a true story. Uh, but the, there's, a, there's a movie about, about Simo Hayek. I can't remember what the movie's called, but his nickname was The White Death. Uh, the Russians tried everything they could to try to take him out, including catching him on fire one time. Dude not only survived, was scarred, permanently scarred for life, but still racked up, you know, by the end of the, the, it, and the, the Winter War only raged for two years, 39 and 40. Um, 
during those that two years, he racked up an impressive in excess of 500 confirmed kills. I'm not talking suspected he got them, confirmed kills. Uh, that's unheard of. And that is yeah. a, just a tremendous amount for one sniper to take out. <laughs> David Bice says that's what you get for backing Vikings against their families. Um, uh, Eric Tushman says, was that where the army soldier that said something attacked them? Uh, and the and last thing one disappeared in Leavenworth. No, this is a different different incident. Uh, Northwoods, you're correct. Pol Poliarni featured heavily in the book for, for Red October, uh, but the Russians still use it. It is still their primary no primary northernmost sub base, uh, and they would not have that had they not ended up taking taking a part of Finland's Finland's uh, Finland's land. In fact, by, uh, the the Treaty of Moscow ended up ceding nine percent of Finland to Russia to call a, a cessation to the conflict. But everybody knows the Finns basically won that war. Because Russia, with all all her weight, could not push Finland any farther than they did. Uh, the Russians took a beating. But here's the the really chilling part. Despite the fact that all the damage that Simo Hayek did, and some of these uh, some of the uh, these other battles that were fought, that which were legendary battles, lots of lots of carnage. The Finns fought hard. There was a Russian special forces unit was sent into a valley, and let me let me find the name of the valley. Uh, had it just a second ago, uh, in a valley in the Kibini, Kibini Mountains, K-H-I-B-I-N-I, -I, the Kibini Mountains. Uh, there was a valley that they they suspected partisans were in, so they sent a special forces team into this this valley to to scout it out. None of them came back. When the Russians finally went looking for them, they found these guys had been torn to shreds. Uh, an entire special forces unit. Obviously, they didn't go. They went down. They didn't go down without a fight. They were, you know, broken weapons and expended ammunition. But these guys had been ripped apart, not shot. They had been torn to pe basically dismembered, ripped apart, claws, the whole nine yards. Well, the Russians said, "Well, it's just the Finns trying to demoralize us, trying to scare us." And the Finns were like, "Oh no, we don't go in that valley." Yeah, we to this day there are, there are people in Finland that claim we had nothing to do with that. What they encountered in that valley should not be encountered. The Russians lost an entire special forces unit to what is suspected to be a group of werewolves. What do you think of that, buddy? Finnish Viking werewolves sounds like a Viking Ulven, like that yeah. movie. Yep, Wolfednar. Yeah, Wolfednar. Oh, um, sounds like a good day as long as you're not a Russian. Yeah, it's a bad day to be a Russian, um, but you know, the, the uh, Finland is is part of that that area, that whole Norwegian, you know, Scandinavian area where the Vikings held their sway. In fact, Russia gets its name from the Rus, a tribe mm -hmm. of Rus a tribe of Vikings who went that far inland, uh, even as far south as Constantinople. Uh, the Byzantine emperor, his personal guards, the Varangian guards, were all Vikings. Mm -hmm. uh, because they were some of the biggest, most powerful warriors of their day. The Vikings were some of the most feared warriors, and they had a rich history of the Ulf Hednar, the wolf, the, the wolf berserkers. Uh, you know, the, the bear berserkers. The, that's where we get the term berserker, bear berserkers. The, mm -hmm. the men who would take on the aspect of a wolf or the or the aspect of a bear and go into a battle, and it was said that no blade or no arrow could stop them. Uh, they fought with, with bare hands. They fought with whatever they could get their hands on. And a lot of the traditions claim that these guys really did change. Uh, now, in a land that's steeped with that kind of tradition, and we start talking about, you know, the werewolf, the werewolves all across Europe, for an entire Russian special, highly armed special forces unit to go in and get just destroyed is unheard of, especially when the cause of death was obviously animal attack. They they weren't blown up. They hadn't been shot. They weren't done you know, done in by sabers or anything of, of the day because this was 1939. It's not like they had some of the weapons that we have. No bombs, no explosions. These guys were found just basically dismembered and shredded. You know, and sometimes we don't think about, I mean, because when you look at Viking lore and tradition, Sometimes that the the werewolf or the wolf head nard that kind of gets shoved to the back burner because you've got so many things like 
you know, Thor and Fenrir and Loki and all, you've got all these things that are just like at the forefront. But when you really get down, they had some, a lot of the stuff that we, that today, like, you know, Yule time and a lot of the Christmas traditions, a lot of that stuff comes from Norse mythology, you know, That's Thursday, true. Thor's day. I mean, most of the days of the week actually come from things that are in Scandinavian and Viking tradition. It, 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 people just don't realize how much of an influence the Vikings had on the things that we do and say every single day of, the, of well, our lives. All of our modern days of the week are named after named after the Norse, except for Saturday. Saturday is Saturn's day, which was a Roman uh, Roman uh, Roman deity. But it's Moon's day, Tears day. Th uh, Odin's day, Thor's day, Frigga's day. Mm -hmm. Sunday is Sun's day. Yep. Miss Naomi, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Can you hear me? Uh, let me turn your volume up. I got a control panel. How about now? Say something now. Does, do I sound louder? Yep. A little bit. Got my microphone on the screen here. There you go. You got, oh, she froze up. Uh-oh. There, there you are. Is. We lost you there for a second. No. Yep, we got you. Yeah, I hear you. We got you. Can you not hear us? How now? Oh, we hear you. Okay, I can hear you. Sweet. I, I have a loose wire somewhere, so I don't know where. I have one I've of them. Got, I've got a loose screw somewhere too. I know how, how that is. <laughs> My wife yeah. might say more than one. <laughs> you never know. So I assume doing? I have to have screws for them to be loose, and I'm pretty sure I don't have any. <laughs> how you been? So doing? How are you, gentlemen? Oh, I'm doing just fine. Sweltering in this summer heat. It has not been, uh, the weather has not been kind here lately. It's cool no. a little bit here in Missouri. It's dropped down to back in the in the upper 80s and 90s, which seems like a welcome cold front after, you know, being in the hundreds. <laughs> yeah, we have that kind of feeling here. Oh, it's only 90 degrees today. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Whew. I can go, you know, hang out outside today. Yeah. So what's new with you guys? Not a whole lot. We were uh, we were discussing about some of the events that happened during World War II, uh, where werewolves slash dogmen type creatures were described attacking soldiers, uh, specifically uh, the events in Finland. Wow, there was an entire. I had heard a little bit about that. Entire Russian unit wiped out by, by what the Finns claimed was a group of werewolves. Wow, that's crazy. And even today, the Finns are like, "It wasn't us." <laughs> <laughs> we're a generally hairless nation <laughs> and apparently and that's the area in the mountains that they still don't go and mm. why would you not take i mean the, russia invaded them so it's not right. like anybody was gonna look down on them if they took out this group of spetsnots why would you not take credit for it even up to this day i mean that yeah, that doesn't yeah. make sense for them to not take credit for it if they exactly had something to do with it. military victories because it makes your military look tougher. But the Finns are like, mm -mm, nope, don't go in that valley. <laughs> so, well, we will we will uh, we have a surprise guest with Miss Naoma, and the reason I invited <laughs> her on is uh, she's had some interesting things happening on her property. Uh, now, here a while back, uh, when back when she was uh, a regular on the show, she was having some incidents where she would hear something hit in the back of her house, usually on nights when her husband wasn't home. But this time something happened, and her husband heard it too. Yes, he did. I want to let in her fact, tell the story from the start to finish, and then we'll get back to the World War II stuff. But this ties in because, well. You'll find out. You'll find out. <laughs> So, Miss Neil, would just start at the beginning when you started texting me the other night. Just start start at the beginning and 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 tell us what's going on. Was that was that Saturday night? Do you remember what night it was? I think it was three nights ago. Yeah, I think it was Saturday night, shortly after I got off the air. Okay. Um. I it's we had a power outage. No, no 
of course, no power means no air conditioning. And we were in the middle of this heat wave and uh, we decided, oh, we'll just go lay out on the bed and we'll cool off. And we kind of both drifted off to sleep, my husband and I. And uh, about 1.30 in the morning, <laughs> we'd been rolling around and trying not to stick to, de to each other for about two or three hours at that point. Brad sat up and he says, I am going to go sit outside. I can't take this heat anymore. This is just miserable. And I said, well, I'll join you in just a second. And so he jumps up and goes outside and I stopped in the bathroom and I headed out. And then when I walked outside, every dog within a mile, maybe even two or three miles of our house was just going crazy. They were barking and howling and yipping and now, we have that a lot. It does happen frequently. Um, I, you know, I don't know what causes the dogs to go off, but it's often enough that when it does happen, which is probably every couple of months or so, I ignore it now. I've lived here for seven years at this point, and seven and a half years, and I just think, eh, whatever's got the dogs riled up, it's got them riled up. I think I could hear some coyotes kind of chirping in the background, you know, they have a little bit, they're, they're, they got that real high, beep, 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 you know, kind of, and I thought I could hear them, but it was definitely domestic dogs that I was hearing. And I stepped outside and I said uh, to my husband, as I was sitting down, how long had they been going off? And he says, for about a minute. And I sat down in the chair and I mean, I had just got seated. <sighs> I'm telling you, I don't know what it was. It was the loudest. It was the, it, guys, I don't know what I heard and I don't know what Brad heard, but that thing yelled so loud and so, I, I'm guessing that thing had to weigh 500 pounds. That was a 500 pound dog out there, but it wasn't a dog. I mean, I, I knew it wasn't a dog. I knew it wasn't a coyote. Uh, I don't think it was a wolf. I don't know what the hell that thing was, but the weirdest part was it started and every dog went dead silent. And then it did it a second time. And it was like, it was coming at us. Like, like I was expecting like to feel this gush of wind hit me. It was coming at us so fast, and I and I looked at Brad, and I said, in the house now, let's go. And, of course, you know, he jumps up and follows me, and, and as we're walking in, he's saying, what is that? What is that? I don't know. I could not tell you from Adam what I heard. It's not an animal I am familiar with, but it was big, and it was loud. And, of course, the only person, the only friend I have who sits up all night who I can talk to about this is DA. And I went, came in here in the bedroom and I sat down and I thought, I got to tell somebody this because nobody's going to believe this. Even, I mean, you know, even though I had a witness, nobody's going to believe this. And so I start texting DA. <laughs> I don't know what I just heard, but it was huge. <laughs> and um, it, you know, we came inside and I, I, I never... <laughs> It wasn't your ex, I'm pretty sure. Um, but anyway, I, it came inside, or we came inside, and we never heard it again. But do you think I could sleep that night? Oh no! I about four thirty, the power or the air conditioning came on, and I wasn't going to sleep until the air came on anyway. But um, oh my god! You know, I still feel shaky when I think about hearing it. You well, sure for. <laughs> Oh, boy. Well, I spent the next two days, I think, or day and a half. I just kept going through every YouTube channel, every internet, every, I, I Googled uh, every animal I could think of and what they sounded like, and I couldn't find anything. I went through YouTube, everything, and I happened across... Um, it just popped up on my feed because I tend to watch their shows um, a few hours earlier. And I think this was last night, maybe D or the night before last night, I think um, I happened across the small town monsters trailer for their new um, documentary called uh, the Texas triangle, I believe. Dogman triangle. 
Yeah, and they were uh, interviewing Tex from Texas Front Porch, and he played uh, a recording of something howling, and it just it froze my blood. It literally, I just, I just sat there stunned. And right away, I, I sent a, uh, the, the link to the, the clip to DA, and I was like, this is what I heard. This is it. But then when I played it for Brad, he said, no, it was a lot higher. It was a lot, a lot, not higher, but it was a little higher pitched, a little clearer sounding, and it was a lot louder. Now, in my defense, I was listening to a recording of a recording. You know, he's holding up his phone and playing the recording, which is being recorded and then played over my computer. And so I'm going to say that it may not have been identical, but it was close enough that it sent chills down my spine. And so if you want to know what it sounded like, go to the YouTube trailer for Small Town Monsters and go to the part where Tex is uh, playing that, and, and he wouldn't identify it. I'm not nearly as versed in this as any of you guys are. I'm not going to identify it. But that was the scariest damn thing I've ever heard. You're and in it, Tennessee, correct? Yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I'm about an hour and a half, two hours uh, east of LBL. And yeah, I'm right. You were in spitting distance of LBL. Yeah. And uh, Dixon, um, which is where. I don't let more rings. Yeah, I'm, I'm like I'm in the heart of it, and and I'm just you know where um, the farmers had the miniature horses and the dogs attacked. Mm -hmm. I, I I'm just south of there. Um, I'm about two counties away from them. Of course, I'm just east of Daniel Boone, where they have a lot of activity. And uh, in the middle of her own werewolf triangle or dogman triangle. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it was Tennessee slash Kentucky dogman triangle, too. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm telling you guys, I'm just grateful. I, I have to be honest with you, DA. I'm just really glad that I was able, I had somebody I that. I mean, I do have other friends who are night owls, but none of them would have listened and said, look, <laughs> I get this. And it was nice to be able to just send it out to somebody and say, hey, <laughs> I know I haven't lost my mind, but that was the scariest. And I didn't say the word damn. <laughs> damn was not in my vocabulary that night. And there was another word, seven letters beginning with F. <laughs> and I was <laughs> dropping that bomb everywhere. <laughs> Well, you know, if I had something run me into my house, I probably would have been pretty shook up, too. I tell you, you know, we're getting ready to move to Illinois, and for the first time, I'm really glad. <laughs> you know, there are sightings in Illinois, too. Yes, I know. I have, in fact, uh, my first husband's family, the farm that I lived on for 20 years, um, I had had my sighting that I've talked about um, up there of a Bigfoot, and, of course, everybody would make fun of me, and the one person who didn't was probably the one person that I just did not get along with, and that was my mother-in-law. And she pulled me aside one night, and she said, I'm going to tell you a story. And she told me how back when she had first married my father-in-law back in the 50s, um, there was something that had been a killing all the animals. They'd had a problem with something, killing the farm animals. And several of the farmers got together, and they went around – they, they kind of went on a night hunt looking for it and they wound up um, cornering it in our barn, the barn that would become ours. And um, she said, I said, was it a Bigfoot? And she said, no, she said, they didn't describe it like that. I said, well, how'd they describe it? She said, I won't tell you. She said, but it wasn't a Bigfoot. And she and never would after that, talk to me about it, but I'm pretty sure they cornered the dog man in my barn. So, well, I, I would, that's something I would want someone to tell me if they found it on my property. Yeah. <laughs> if it scares the crap yeah. out of me, I want to know because it was there. Yeah. But, that's one of the things like, you know, tell me because I don't want to go out to, to check the mail one day and run nose to nose with this thing. Yeah. Where you can go, boop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was I was to do that to a grizzly bear once. Thank God it ended. 
it was a it was a brown pants moment for me i can tell you but fortunately the bear was not hungry and probably didn't like the smell of things and decided he didn't want to eat me yeah well the other night was a sphincter winker for me i'm telling you i was like <laughs> i'm sure i left a trail coming in the house and you know and to his credit brad didn't doubt me he didn't he didn't say oh you know let's see out, stay out here and see what it is he he took my word that we needed to be inside and and i love him for that because every other man i've ever had in my life like i've had so many but you know the other men that i've had in my life um would have laughed at me and they would have stood out there and been attacked or eaten before they would have ever admitted there was something wrong they wouldn't have laughed again that they <laughs> that's a fact it only laughed once <laughs> and they'd have been laughing while i walked out on the porch but like, okay then you just hang out out here i'll be inside with the door <laughs> yeah. bolted. i would have yeah. laughed at you but i would have stayed out there and see if i could find out what it was it was coming right at us robbie it was coming right at us it was it was i I didn't see anything and I I'm only telling you the feeling I had, but the feeling was I was being, we were being charged and there, there is an instinct that you have in your body that says you're in danger. And that instinct I, was going off on a four alarm fire I, mode. I've had that instinct kick in a few times. I know exactly what you're talking about. And I've only, I can honestly say I've only had it a couple of times in my life where I truly felt threatened. And I think that if you'd been on that porch the other night, you'd have felt threatened enough that you'd have stepped inside too. Now, did that stop me from going and looking out the window? No, <laughs> but um, I didn't see anything. I mean, there was nothing. It's just no. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, especially once it's pitch black. If that thing, you know, if it's like Robbie and I suspect that their 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 coat is a dark enough color that it that it blends in well with its surroundings, it's going to be very difficult to see in the darkness. But from the sound of it, how close do you think it was? I I felt like when we got in the house, I felt like it started probably five hundred yards away. And from the time I said, um, maybe a thousand yards away, but from the time I said in the house now, and we got up and stepped inside and it's only three steps to the door. It's not like we had to run the length of the porch or anything. I would say it was within 150 yards of us. I felt so threatened. I felt sick to my stomach. Like I just escaped death threatened that night. And, you know, and Brad, he, he's not a believer and he's until one comes up and and hands him a bouquet of flowers and proposes marriage he's never going to be a believer um but he was intimidated he knew something was wrong and for a non-believer to feel react that way i think also says um my one of my old lieutenants he said you remember the time i actually scared accidentally scared fig with an officer we worked with named figueroa uh, After he made my butthole blink, I, it became our definition of scared. <laughs> I liked working with Fig, but the thing, Fig was an awesome, awesome dude to work with. But the, when when the inmates got him riled up, the madder he got, the less you understood him. You couldn't understand a word out of his mouth when he got worked up. I had a great uncle that was the opposite. You couldn't understand him at all unless you'd really get mad. And then you could understand every word you didn't want to. So, yeah, anyway, that was my big experience the other night. And hopefully it'll be the last one we have here before we move. Well, you know, um, that kind of lines up with with uh, other accounts that I've taken. Uh, one that I talked to uh, about a, from an old boy uh in Paducah. This is one of the stories I, that I, I wrote down and was looking at my notes the other day. It's one of the stories I got from a guy in Paducah, uh, Paducah Kentucky. Uh, he lives not too far from LBL, just across the river, uh, across the lake. He said that one night he heard something that he didn't know what it was. His was dogs out. He said it was a summer night and had his windows open, much like you. He said his AC wasn't working, so he's sleeping with the windows open. But it scared him bad enough. He shut the windows, locked everything down, and you know, it was just set with the fan on until you know he felt like it was safe enough. You know, until the sun came up. Uh, but when he went back to his bedroom window to open the window up the next day, the the, the screen had been shredded. Wow. He said, wow. "I'm damn glad I shut that window." Absolutely. 
That is something that I didn't do. I didn't go outside and look around for tracks the next day. Um, I don't know that I really wanted to know for sure that there was anything out there. Well, um, there's something out. You know, as to what it is, hard to say. But considering your proximity to LBL, Werewolf Springs, and Daniel Boone, uh, yeah, I think we got a pretty damn good idea what was out there. Uh, yeah. No, Marty Fox says, do you think it was a warning? Are there any animals on the property that may, maybe came to have for dinner? Not on my property. Um, <laughs> since moving to Tennessee, I have become wildly allergic to everything. We are the only family on our road that doesn't have dogs and cats. Um, on both end of our roads are farms. Um, the the on the behind the houses across the road is cattle field. Cattle and sheep are down at that end. I'm pointing this way, but it's really that way. And then up at this end, it's, um, uh, I think they have, uh, I mean, we are surrounded by animals. We're the only ones on the, if they were coming to our property, they wouldn't come to eat the pets. And if it was coming for dinner, I'm pretty sure I know who was on the menu. You're not too awful far as the crow flies from uh, where those two people were killed in Crook County, Tennessee, where they still consider, have it listed as, as uh, unsolved. So, you know, yeah. it's the Freedom of Information Act can't be done. Even though they claimed it was done by dogs, they've never closed the case, so you can't subpoena the files. I have read the, the autopsy reports <laughs> on both of them. And I can tell you, and I even showed those to Robbie, and as a career cop, that is the most redacted, ludicrous mm -hmm. autopsy report I've ever seen. There's so much information omitted from that. Yeah, yeah, that's That was a watered-down for public consumption autopsy report, completely yep. sanitized. There was a guy down here in Nashville, um, right on the north side of Nashville, there's a park that runs the uh, pretty good stretch along the, um, you know, the river that everything's named after down here. Starts with a C. Anyway, uh, I can Cumberland? never, re Cumberland, thank you. Um, it runs along the, the Cumberland runs through Nashville and it runs on basically the north side of Nashville. It's a pretty good little park. It's it's not well maintained. It's just more of a wilderness area. But it's it the Cumberland runs right through the heart of Nashville. So you've got north of there. You've got um, oh my gosh, you've got Gallatin and um, Mount Joy and and Hendersonville and uh, you, uh, tons and tons of towns. On the other side down there, you've got downtown Nashville. Um, around the curve of the river there, you've got East Nashville. It is in the heart of the city. It's not like it's, I mean, I can't say it's in the heart of the city, but it's surrounded by, you know, urban areas. And uh, about seven years ago, a man was camping down there. I think he may have been homeless, but he was camping down there and uh, he disappeared. And they found the tent. It was all torn to pieces. They never did find the man. They found where it looked like he'd been attacked by something. I recently was trying to find that report, and that report has vanished from the Internet. I, can't I had the find same it. thing with, uh, when Steve and I were doing research on Joe Bald. We found, uh, if Steve was here, he could tell you the exact one because he's the one that found him. We were we were sitting at his place. He had his, uh, his laptop out, and we were looking for missing person cases from Stone County from near, near uh, the, the uh, old Joe Bald camp area. And I can't believe it was either seven or 11 missing persons associated with that park prior to it closing. And then later when I wanted to print out that information to have it on hand, to use it as reference material for the books, every one of those sightings were gone. We I'm learning. Yeah, I am learning when you find it, print it because it'll, yeah. it won't be there later. We, and you, you remember the one that we, uh, you and I found Naoma? Uh, the yes. one that said, this is not a conspiracy, so don't ask. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you can't find anything. The, the bicyclist that got uh, mm -hmm. both of them. Yeah, got that's killed. disappeared. Yeah, you can't find it. On uh, I, mm -hmm. I found it Canada. one time, and then when I went back to try to find it, it was, it was gone. Yeah, that was yeah, the one one of the ones that I had found. A tree. Yeah, the one with the bike. Yeah. 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 You can't. Mm -hmm. I, I've tried. I've tried I've, the bicycle 35 feet up a tree. Yeah, I have looked and looked and looked for that one too, and I can't find it anymore either. Mm -hmm. So and they, they disappeared. I believe it was in the southern end of LBL. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it mm -hmm. wasn't far from the original, 
the the family that was in the camp. Oh, okay. Then that, that'd be the north end. Then because, yeah, that'd have to be the north end. Uh, the north were, end. If I remember the story, like I said, I can't find it to, to go back and look at it again. They but if I remember, in. they were biking in from one end, and I want to say they were coming from. I believe that they originally were coming from somewhere in Louisiana. Yeah, and they were headed headed through, and they they called one of them sister who was they were talking with, and said, "Hey, we got a storm pretty much chasing us. We're going to camp out." uh in the lbl and wait out the storm and then we'll get back on the road in the morning and, and they never, never, yeah they never checked never checked back in with the sister uh so she ended up sending uh you know getting police and you know all search and rescue to go look for them and they found i want to say the remains of one tent maybe uh well, there's a, there are numerous incidents of them finding torn up campgrounds in LBL yeah. and not finding people. But they found one of the bicycles <laughs> 20 to 35 feet up a tree, bent backwards around, folded around the tree. Yeah. There are certain incidents at LBL that I actually wanted to put together in a book. And I started working on it last December. And that was when I went back and started looking these things up and couldn't find them anymore. Um, one of them was the, of course, the the family, which is the most famous one. Uh, the one's the hunter. Um, one was the story that uh, um, Martin Groves tells. One was the bicyclist, and one was the two hikers. And I am really struggling to find data on that. I can't. I, I mean, the book is great, and I I know exactly how I'm going to put it together and everything, but I can't find the data to back up the stories that I have, you know, as a creative writer have warped to the point that they're no longer true. You know, they, yeah. I couldn't trust my stories. Well, there's another and, story about a group of Cub Scouts. Uh, the scout leaders had taken these kids on a, on a hike and they saw two of these things paralleling them in the trees and the scout leaders didn't want to panic the kids. So they turned the kids around and headed back to the ranger station, keeping the kids bunched up together. And they said the things were getting pretty damn close by the time they came inside of that razor, razor, uh, ranger station. Now, I hadn't heard that one. That would have been a good one to add, but I, I can't find the stories. They're just, they've the been wiped off the internet. Part. A lot of them just have absolutely disappeared. And you go talk, I mean, I've got Martin Groves is, has, you know, is more than happy to be interviewed and I've got one of his books to, to reference, but, um, get him on the show. Yeah, I like him. Um, but I, um, there's, I, and I could probably eventually find people who could give me reasonable facsimiles of what happened, but I don't want to trust my own memory and you can't go ask people up around the LBL cause they don't want to talk about it. Right. And so and, uh, in um, right across the, the, the canal over in uh, what is that? Grand Rivers. Mm -hmm. They get off if you bring it up. Yeah. I got stored in, in Grand Rivers for bringing it up. Yeah. So I be by the shirt and chuck me out the door. But he basically said, you know, I don't want to talk about it. Get out of my store. You have a nice day. Yeah. That, so it's really that's frustrating. The that's the same place that cop told you. Cop the cop, yeah. you need to drop it or get out of yeah. it. You know what's good for you? I drop it. I said, I'm just researching a book. I'm a retired cop, showed him my credentials. He said, All right, I'm going to tell you, cop to cop, that's you probably want to drop this. And he wouldn't talk about it anymore. He said, This wow. is not something you want to dig into. Yes, yeah, just, and I, I hate that. I mean, tell me the only reason he was saying anything at all is because I was a cop. Yeah. But that in itself, and I don't have that benefit. Yeah, because yeah. if there's nothing to it, why would you even say that? Right. If you, you have cop to cop, just say cop to cop. It's just all bullshit. These stories got started. You know, you, that's pretty much how cops, will, you know, will be with each other. You know, they, we can't confirm or deny in the public, but another cop asks, like, all right, I wouldn't worry about it. You know, this we've got this situation handled, or we think it was this, or but no, no, this guy was adamant and he was not happy about even talking about it. He wasn't giving me an inch. It you know, it's almost like that. Uh, if you think about that scene in uh, Freddy versus Jason, when they were in, in the uh, sheriff station and they were thinking that, that it was Freddy coming back, that's almost the kind of attitude. You, hey, we don't talk about this. If you talk about this stuff, it'll happen. So right. don't talk about it. Yeah. Well, I don't want to talk about this anymore, guys. 
Grand Rivers is one of those towns that draws pretty much 95 to 100 percent of its revenue off of tourists. I mean, they've got two big lakes there. They've got a, a, a couple of big bass fishing tournaments that run out of there. They've got resorts there. It all caters to the lake traffic. Um, they do not like you to bring up anything to do with anything negative about LBL because they get hurt them. Now, Annette and I, when Annette and I, Nick, my, my middle son, we stayed there in Grand Rivers for, I believe it was five nights. And I wanted to stay a couple extra days, but we, they, somebody had already booked our condo. So we had to, the next closest hotel we could get was in Paducah. So we stayed in Paducah a couple extra days while I was still dicking around, running around L, LBL with Nick Valente. Uh, but at the evenings at, in Paducah, I was talking to people. And uh, hell, I had people that, you know, just like, hey, I heard you talking to so-and-so. You might want to hear this. I was got I got people just unsolicited telling me stories of crap that happened to them. Uh, mm. A lot of stuff. People in Paducah are not afraid to talk about it. Grand Rivers, they don't don't even want you to mention. It's crazy. Or, well, yeah, Grand Rivers is a pretty place. A little odd, especially if you bring up the LBL incidents. Yeah, I mean, I... I'm going to be up in Illinois soon and I'm going to be out of range of actually being able to go physically interview a lot of these people, which is too bad because I think it would have been a great book, but I just, I've been running into so many dead ends with it. that well, You can still do a lot of interviews like on, on something like this. Skype interviews are fine, but <clears> I, I still prefer when I, when I talk to somebody, when I take an account, I want to be able to see their eyes. I want to be able to see their body language and you can still do that on, on Skype. So it's, so it's better than just an audio call. Um, because like Robbie and I say, once you once you've had had those had the, the the classes, once you've had the training, you know those little tells to look for, and uh, you can you can tell when somebody's you know truly experiencing a vivid bad emotion or just telling you a story. Yeah. Yeah, and see, you could lie to me all day, and I wouldn't know. <laughs> like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, Blue says we were around to Mumbers. I had some interesting crap happen at Mumbers, and supposedly, according to Elijah Henderson, there was another in incident that happened in Mumbers Bay. I want to say in '74 or '78. This is prior to the family that was killed in LBL. This was a couple. Uh, a guy who worked for a fishing game was fishing early one morning out in Mumbers Bay, and up on the bay, he saw a couple of people getting out of their tent. Uh, and there was one of these things sneaking up on the tent and he was trying to get their attention, yelling and pointing. And he said before, before he could do anything, it attacked him, attacked and killed both those people. And it got completely covered up. I heard that, uh, th that, uh, particular story appeared on, um, uh, American, uh, werewolves, I think documentary. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that, that is really, a. a that poor guy, I mean, they, they interviewed him, and he just looked so haunted. I just felt so bad for him for having witnessed that. Yeah. Well, you know, Make, and that's something else. It. It's, it's, it's one thing, you know, it's one thing, yeah, like, uh, you know, anybody, you know, get, uh, like uh, actors on television in, in particular, like my wife and I will we'll be watching some, like, a cop drama, and I'm pointing stuff out. I'm like, no, we don't do that. We don't do that. She's like, would you shut up and just let me watch the show? But it, it, the little inconsistencies like, in, inconsistencies like that completely ruin a performance for me because the, people don't react that way. You know, cops don't react that way. Um, we've been watching SWAT on uh, on Netflix, and I've just been destroying that show. Because <laughs> it's so stupid, some of the crap they do. I'm like, nope, we don't do that. Nope, we don't do that. Nope, we don't do that. And, uh, I'm, and I, I was never a SWAT. I was on the riot team, but I was never a SWAT team member. And even I'm spot crap. They're like, no bull crap. That doesn't happen. Uh, but, you know, it's it, things like that. It's just those are things that unless you know, you don't know. Um, but, you know, these are those are the same things. Like when you see when you see somebody who like this guy with fishing game, when you see his visceral reaction, you just you know this is somebody that's reliving a traumatic experience, not somebody that's regurgitating lines. Yeah. Like Fred. Right. Like, like when Fred, Fred, Fred Roll, when he was on, when he was telling his story, the dude still gets shook up years later talking about the, the incident that happened to them in that hunting cabin. And that's visceral. That's where even his dogs react to it. Now, my, I don't know even know about y'all, but my, I've got a dog. He's, well, we think he's mostly pit bull. He's a rescue, so we don't know 100% for sure. Uh, but he has this uncanny 
sixth sense of knowing when something's bothering me or my wife or one of the boys. He'll come over and he'll put his head in your lap and he'll follow you around. He'll check on you. He just has this uncanny ability to spot when something's bother you, bothering you. And uh, he's and dogs are really good at that. But when Fred was telling his stories, both of his dogs were like trying to get in his lap, like looking at him, checking him out. They knew something had him shook up. So, you know, you might be able to fake like a nervous reaction, but you can't fake enough to fool dogs. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it was like you said, every time Fred tells that story, every time we've watched him tell that story, you can just see in his face that he's reliving it. You know, he's just every single time is reliving all those details. Yeah. Thank you, brother. I'm not the only one. <laughs> so anyway, that was my story guys. And, um, you know, I don't know quite what to make of it. I, 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 I legitimately think you heard a dog, man. I really do. I, I said that. I said that when you when you texted me. I'm like, oh, considering everything that's around you, and the proximity of all the incidents that have happened in your area. I mean, you you aren't too terribly far from where that like 13 year old kid was dragged up a mountainside. Yeah, no, that's about three or four counties away from me. So yeah, that's pretty. You you've had a lot of weird animal attacks in your area. <laughs> yeah, and we, I, I mean. I, I have a, a strong suspicion if you and your husband had stayed out on the porch, you might have been another one. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. I, I, I can't stress enough how threatened I felt. You know, I just... Um, Thanks, Scott. There was an instinct inside my brain that was just exploding like fireworks. Oh yeah, we, you know humans. Humans are hardwired as predators. Uh, animal animals that have eyes facing forward evolved as predators. Animals that have the eyes on the side of their head evolved as prey. That's just how. That's just biology. That's basic biology. Now, don't get me started on basic biology, but that's another story. But anyway, <laughs> it's just basic biology. We were hardwired as predators, and as predators, we know when other more dangerous predators are around. Yep. Yeah. If you're out in the woods and you feel like you're being hunted, guess what? Your instinct is probably right. Yeah. And that was one time when I really <clears throat> um <laughs> Well, at least my daughter-in-law doesn't think I created two of them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I actually do think that there is a certain um, personality type that it does attract. Um, have you run into feral speedo bear? <laughs> I told you. This made her laugh at her, but her screen froze up. Uh oh. Can you hear me? Okay, I thought. Naomi, you froze up. Yep, she froze. I told you though that you're never gonna live this the speedo <laughs> paradigm. See, it's it's done froze Naoma. Yeah, it's so bad it froze Miss Naoma up. I, I really do. I think I think because because you know, she sent me that link to that preview and said this is the sound I heard and it was that sound that that uh, text played for us. That howl that he recorded out of Brown Springs. Yeah, I need to see if Steve recorded that sound that we heard that night. If he did, I need to get that to you and let you uh, see if you can compare it to what you've heard. Yeah, I don't know if I'm back or not. She's still, yeah, she's just. What, you, I have you, no sound. You, watch, that, watch that video. Uh, I'll send you the link. Yeah, just watch that that preview video from Small Town Monsters. That sounds <laughs> oh, this is you so can see you know, sounds like what you heard. I have to go do that then. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned on the, uh, your most recent episode you dropped from what's really out there. You, we, you mentioned the veil, which we've mentioned before. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, is it a thinning of the veil, or is it just these things are starting to lose their fear of us? I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, because, you know, we've talked about the whole time that we were, that what, three years that we were not there, 
so they moved back into that. We've, we've said it before. It doesn't take nature long to take back over an area right. that is devoid of humans. So you they move back into that area. Then all of a sudden, okay, you're good. You can go back out. We go back out. We're right there. And then, you know, the paradigm shift, once things, once you see something like that, you can't not see it. And you're all, you're going to be looking for more. And every, it's kind of like my, my tracker uh, trainer told me, he said, you know, when he was shaking our hands, he said, congratulations, you'll never look at the ground the same way again. And that's true with this too. Once you see the, these things and you know that things like that are out there, you'll never look at the woods or listen in the woods the same way ever again. Because exactly. every sound that you hear, you're going to be like, hmm. I lost my that... But every little sound you hear, every little twig, it's not every little, you're looking to see, hey, is there, is there that pattern there again? Is that sound there again? Is, you know, is that scrape? Is that a footprint again? It's just, like you said, it's, it's, it's like being hardwired to be a predator. Once you're, hunting for these things so to speak you're you're never not hunting for them i mean i rarely go in the woods not looking for that but even before i got back into this with you i was still always you know looking differently every time i went back into the woods Yeah, it hit all of us in the funny bone, I think. Uh, um, but yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I had my first experiences, even though I didn't actually see what approached my deer stand. I had my first experiences when I was in my teens. Now, I, you saw one when you were, what, eight? Yeah, there roughly. I, I didn't see it. But even, but from then on, I couldn't look at the woods the same because I knew there was something out there. Uh, yeah. My uncle was convinced. My uncle went to his grave convinced that they, they were on his land. Uh, yeah. There were certain parts of his land he just he wouldn't let you hunt. Uh, he was he had he had a hundred and sixty some acres right up against uh, almost five or six thousand acres of conservation land that people weren't allowed to hunt. And the area of his land that bordered the conservation land, he said, stay the hell out of that bo- that bottom land. He said, "Do not go down there." And that's where I lost that deer, uh, the yeah. one that dropped down in, into the into the ravine. When I went down and looked for it and found the, found where it had bled out, I found no sign of it. And I radioed him. He's like, "You know, you're not supposed to be down there. Get the hell out of there. You're going to join the deer." Uh, yeah. So he he knew they were there. Um, and, well, but it, from that time on, I mean, I've from then I just don't take take things in the woods for granted. I mean, you hear a sound. For most people, you out in the woods, you hear a twig break behind you. You assume it's an animal, or or just the fact that you know, you know sticks break. Uh, but you don't really put a, a higher emphasis on it until you have a reason to. Um, yeah, you, know, you once you you have you have accepted that these things are out there. Once you the possibility of their existence is more than just a possibility. Um, at that point, things in the woods take on a different connotation. You're no longer just looking for possible animal sign. You're looking for threat sign. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's before before you accept something like that, you really it's it's, it's kind of like that uh, toughest guy on the block syndrome. Mm-hmm. You know, before you accept the fact that these animals or these creatures or whatever you want to call them exist. Most people go in the woods with, you know, I got a gun. I, I, I what am I worried about? You know, I, especially if you're in an area that doesn't really have a whole a high population of bears or wolves, you know, what else is there going to be other than maybe a mountain lion or a bobcat or something like that? Right. It's really going to cause you any kind of harm. But once you realize that stuff like this is real, you're not the baddest, you know, what on the block anymore. Yeah. And it, you know, every every big snap and tree or tree limb might now suddenly be something far more sinister. Uh, Penny Van says, "Have any of you spent the fourth out in the LBL?" I've been in the LBL, uh, spent days in the LBL, uh, but it wasn't there on the fourth of July. I was there at the end of July. But I think it's like I said back to the your original question. I think it's just a combination of both because things are starting to happen more frequently 
And I don't know if right. that's up in a lot of places. Yeah. And I don't know if that's because of the the veil thinning or more people just I think like I said, that it's gotta be a combination because when people are out of the forest for three years and these things start moving back in and then all of a sudden people come back in, mm -hmm. it's automatically just you know, they're butted up together. And you know, not as many people go out hunting as they used to. I'm not saying that hunting's dying off because there's still millions of people that hunt every season. I'm not saying it's a you know it's a dying off thing. I'm just saying not as many people hunt for their existence as well, once did well, because it's so much easier just to go to the grocery store and get stuff. So most of these people that are going out in the woods ain't armed. Well, but as as a hunter, it's hard to hunt nowadays because if you're not if you don't have the money and you're in a hunting club somewhere. It's hard to go find somewhere on, you know, public access, you know, game management that you can actually hunt because it's first come, first serve. And, you know, you go, it, it's hard to hunt if you don't have the money to get into one of these high dollar clubs. Or, you, you know, somebody with a lot of land you can hunt. Yeah. Uh, even then, I mean, it's not an inexpensive hobby. I mean, you know, you've got to have a good, you've got to have a good deer rifle. Um, if you, if you were bifocals like me, you might want to invest in a good scope. Yeah. <laughs> My days of, you know, 250, 300 meter shots with iron sights are pretty much over, I'm afraid. But, you know, the, um, you know, you, 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 the ammo is not, not cheap. And plus you want to go out and you want to target practice because you make sure you hit the broad side of a barn because last thing you want to do is just wound one and have to track it forever. Yeah. Uh, you want, you want to hit a good solid hit first time. Uh, so there's, there's. You know, there's a lot go a lot goes into this. Plus, you know, processing a deer is not cheap unless you know how to cut it up yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, the licensing, the safety classes, the safety gears, your deer, your deer stand, deer plot feeders. You can put a lot of money into deer hunting. Very, very expensive hobby. David By says most of the good land is being leased by city folks with more money than sense. He ain't wrong. That's a hundred percent. When I was, uh, I was fifteen or sixteen, uh, there was an old boy came down to uh, Laclede County to deer hunt for who's from Kansas City, and uh, he he actually used a come along to to winch a mule up into the bed of his truck and brought it into the into the into the check in station. He thought he got a mule deer. Yeah, but yeah, he got. Yeah. But but that's that's to your point though. Like you said, you know, it's not the hunting's dying off. It's just it's becoming one of those things that, you know, all these super rich people have, have gotten into all of a sudden or not all of a sudden, I guess, but that they've gotten into and it, it, it just about pushed normal people out of that. And, you know, and it, it happens with everything. I mean, you know, it gets to the point where it gets popular and, you know, people buy up all the, the good places to go hunt. And so, a lot of the people who go to the woods now are just going to camp or, or hike. War criminal says he's got twenty five hundred just in his boat. Oh yeah, I mean it, it's yeah, easy. I mean, you want to rob his bow stands? Those are badass. Crystal McGee says I went to high school with her husband Chris. We've known each other since we were. I went. I think I was probably fourteen when I met him as I moved back from New Mexico to Missouri and started hanging out. She remember, he remembers that down on my Uncle Buddy's land. He's been out there. That place was creepy as hell. Certain times of the year, he wouldn't let you camp at all. Miss Naoma, you're not going to be able to make it back in, I guess? Yeah, she said she couldn't figure out her connection issue. She said oh. that a little bit. Yeah, I missed it. Yeah, I was waiting for her to pop back in. But, yeah, she you know, I, I just now got it. I can remember when I was a kid, my stepdad used to go hunting like every day he was off during hunting season. He was in the woods. And now, you know, I mean, he's got places that he's got friends that let him go hunt, but he doesn't get it's, it's hard to go because you he has to go down lower part of the state. So, you know, what? Whereas when, you know, when I was younger, he was hunting a lot of the land 
where I had my sighting. That's most of the time where he, and he got the first deer I ever remember him getting. He got out of that, that area. But now there's, you know, people are moving in uh, trailer parks and housing developments and things like that. And there again, that's part, that's probably part of what, because you get all these people wanting to move into the places like that. And they're pushing these things into areas that they've never been in before. You know, you know which, one of the most dangerous situations you can find yourself in is when large predators, and I'm not just talking cryptids, when with large predators, mountain lions, bears, wolves, stop seeing us as a threat and start seeing us as a food source. Mm -hmm. uh, Miss Lene says they seem to be all trophy hunters around here. Most of you don't even use the meat. To me, that's just an absolute shame. I, I, yeah. we, I we always hunted for meat. I mean, you know, we, we put the meat in the freezer. Uh, when I was when I was little, uh, that's you know, my family made it through the winter with with deer meat and fish they caught and squirrels and anything else that got hunted turkeys. You know, they, everybody, somebody went out on a season all the time and put stuff in the deep freeze. I'm the youngest of eleven kids growing up on a farm. You supplemented your you supplemented your, that 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 food bill as best you could. Well, I can't tell you how many chickens I plucked and, you know, how many times I walked behind a tractor helping pick up sweet potatoes and how many. I was old enough to set up and steer. My dad had put me on the tractor and say, all right, you just keep it going in a straight line while we pick up the hay. Yep. And then when I got big enough to throw the, uh, throw the bales, my dad was going back to driving and it was my turn to get my ass out there and throw hay. Oh boy, there he is. I was wondering when the love was gonna start. <laughs> hey Ken, how you doing, brother? Um where I were knew we I was gonna catch all the love tonight. Since chronic wasting disease, I stopped eating venison. Here in Missouri, whenever and whenever it's season the deer season, uh whenever you check your deer in, they can perform a test for CWD. And uh, if if I'm if I get back into hunting, which I haven't done it in years, uh, but if I do do decide to get back into it, I will absolutely get that get my get everything tested before I have it cut. There's an old boy uh, that owns a uh, owns a butcher shop out here in Rogersville that's really reasonable on cutting up a deer, and uh, I'd like to throw my hat in the lottery for uh, some of the. Uh, the limited elk hunts they're starting to allow down near Eminence, Missouri. They re reintroduced a herd of elk uh, in down around Eminence in the southern part of Missouri uh, back around 2002, 2003, and the population has exploded. Uh, they, they, they've taken off way more than anybody thought they would. So now they're actually going to start authorizing limited hunts, but it's going to be like a lottery. I mean, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be really lucky to get one, but I can tell you elk, if you've never had elk, way better than venison it's you know elk venison it's all venison oh, yeah. but uh, elk has a better flavor than deer and you get one elk you you better you better have a big deep freeze because that's oh, yeah. with few, there's a, few, uh, 800 to a thousand pounds of meat there's a restaurant around here uh called uh saskatoon's mm -hmm. and that's all they sell is wild or wild game and that's the first place I ever got an elk steak, and I fell in love with that. That is the oh, best steak I've ever oh, had in my fantastic. life. Fantastic. We would take it and marinate it overnight in carne asada and then grill it. Oh, oh, oh so good. Throw mm -hmm. some lime in that carne asada. It really softens that. Oh, so tender. Mm. Miss Lene says, I wish they had elk season here in, here in Illinois. I, I don't know if Illinois has any indigenous elk. They didn't here in Missouri. Originally, back in the, the I want to say, I think it was around 1860, 1865, somewhere around the, the end of the Civil War, the last of the elk were hunted out of Missouri due to the expansion west. Uh, and it wasn't until you know, 2002, 2003, when Missouri Department of Conservation decided to reintroduce them. And I would say it's not going to be long before they're spreading up into this area. But there, I guess they're as thick as thieves down near Eminence. I know when they reintroduced black bears down in Arkansas, it didn't take but about five years, and we were seeing them in southern Missouri. And now they're everywhere. Well, there's elk moving all the way up. Uh, they're, they're in Tennessee and in North Carolina, and they're 
probably going to be showing up in South Carolina if, it, if they hadn't already show up in South Carolina for too long because all that where they put them out on the Appalachian Trail. Mm -hmm. So my uh, my son Noah, he was uh, telling me that it wasn't too terribly long ago that there were moose sightings in northern Missouri for the first time in almost two hundred years. I mean, moose hadn't been this far into Missouri since the early eighteen hundreds. Um, and you know, supposedly they they moved into into some of the farming areas in northern Missouri. Uh, that's a big animal. I, I that's one one of the young yellings I've never had. I've never had moose. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I've ever had moose either. But doesn't mean I wouldn't like to try. I would definitely give it a try, and that's a big animal. You better have one monster deep freeze if you go moose hunting. Um. Uh, Scott says there was moose on the Great Plains when Lewis and Clark went, had their expedition. Yeah, they uh, Lewis and Clark took very detailed notes, and uh, parts of the Lewis and Clark journals are still classified. Weird, <laughs> huh? Ken said moose is a tactical assault cow. <laughs> That's right. A very dangerous one. You know, there are more people killed in Alaska every year by moose than by grizzly bear. I I, I do not doubt it. Have you, you said, we talked about that. That video where that guy, the kids had been throwing the uh, snowballs, snowballs at the moose and her cow, and that and guy that just guy walked out, of, walks out of the bank and just got just got blindsided. He got curb stomped by a moose. Yes, he did. He didn't survive. No, nope. moose will mess you up. That's a big animal too. Yeah, and it it wasn't like it hit him one time and walked off. I mean, it like yeah, it it just kept kept putting it to him. Uh, Tomb says, hopefully that moose ain't as big as the one I showed you, DA. He sent me a picture of yeah. a moose the other day that uh, looked like it was on steroids. It was just the, the TikTok moose. Yeah, with the guys yeah I, he sent that one to me, too. That was a moose that's been to federal prison or something. Yeah. Uh, we kind of got sidetracked talking about hunting and ungulates. We ought to get back to talking dogmen and werewolves. Um Kind of recap a little bit. We talked about uh, about the incident in Finland. Uh, Rob, what, I mean, what do you think about that? Do you think it, you think it was just partisans, like the Russians said, or do you think the Finns really are telling the truth? What, like I said, I mean, what's the point of them not taking credit for taking out? Because, like you said, it, you know, it doesn't do anything but make their military look stronger. So, in that situation, in that time, when Russia's invaded, you, you're not in the wrong. That would be the perfect time to say, "Yeah, we, you know, we kicked their their special forces butts," but they're yeah. like, "No, it wasn't us." I mean, you don't want to go in that place. To me, that just uh, that that lends credence to the fact that there there was something more than just, you know, it, you know, it, it's not like you know, uh, even no matter how well trained a crack unit was there's no way they went in with wolverine style claws and killed a killed a bunch of guys armed with with you know, rifles and automatic weapons because these guys had not been shot they'd been ripped apart uh it, it, it's you know it's not like they'd been you know had, had they discovered uh that these guys had been blown up and shot and stabbed and then dismembered no the the cause of death was obviously they'd been mauled to death by some big animal yeah so i mean unless there was a indigenous population of the you know grizzly bears that just happened to move in over there or polar bears or whatever they got over there that moved into that valley within you know a couple of days hunting packs. That, that's what i'm saying <laughs> you would think a, an entire unit would have killed a rogue bear yeah and you know a, a wolf pack's not gonna do anything to a a highly trained group of uh special forces so i mean it had to be something that was Roxanne bad enough on it do what werewolf is called the werewolf is called varansis on that massacre of the, of the russian platoon well that was awesome thank you for uh, for finding that that is freaking cool you know, that, but that Scandinavian area is, is rich with history of like the berserkers and and Nor Norse tradition of of animals that that you know were, were far more intelligent than they should be, like Hugin and Munin, Freak and Gary, Od Odin's wolves. Yep. Um, the the the, you know, the Fenris wolf. Um, you know, what if 
what if the what if the uh, what if they found the binding place of Fenrir? That would have been you know, well. I guess it was scary. Ragnarok, it could kill a bunch of armed soldiers. Oh yeah, easy. And Fenris Wolf was uh, in some forms of the legend. That's where werewolves came from. He's the 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 godfather of all werewolves. Mm -hmm. So it's not like and, the, in Norse mythology, the, the 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 werewolf type creature. Not necessarily calling it a werewolf itself, but th that type of creature is not unheard of. No, and you know, like we've said before, the term dogman was not used until basically recently. Uh, the mid mid to late nineties, I think it was. Yes, I mean. I think the, the actual phrase "dogman" was coined by a radio a radio DJ up in uh, Michigan when they were talking about the so, the Michigan dogman. He started what, calling it dogman, and they recorded that song. What we're talking about right now that happened then, this would have been called a werewolf, right? Hey, well, we look back, you know, before the term "dogman," or look back to the time when we were kids, back in the seventies. If somebody saw an upright, on two legs, hair covered, wolf like creature. We would have immediately said werewolf. werewolf. And, you know, then if you take that back to the 1800s, if people hadn't heard the term werewolf, they would say wolfman. Or mm -hmm. if, if they were if they were uh, were followers of Native American lore, the Ulanga dog Lala. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are lots of terms in Native Native mythology for these these animalistic creatures. Uh, the, and the Ulanga dog Lala is just the one that just rapidly pops to my mind. It means uh, is it spirit with knife teeth? Yep. Or uh, long dogs is is it long dogs yeah, uh, and Barry seventy six seventy six says isn't Saint Clair Christopher depicted as a dog headed man? Yes, the he was known as the saint. Dog saint. Uh, he in most Catholic iconography he's depicted as having the head of a dog. And uh, Sinocephalus, yep. <laughs> King Lycian, uh, who uh, was uh, that's from Greek mythology. He's he's in according to the Greek mythology, he's believed to be the first werewolf. King Lycian was so vain. He invited uh, Zeus himself to have dinner with him, and he wanted to test if Zeus was as omnipotent and as powerful as he cl as everybody claimed. He thought he could outwit Zeus, so he had his own youngest son butchered and served to Zeus. Well, of course, Zeus immediately knew what it was, and for his vanity and for what he did to his own child, Zeus cursed him to be this dog-like creature. Uh, so, according to the Greeks, that's the origin of the Sinocephali. However, mm -hmm. The Greeks and the Romans both talked of the Sinocephali during their campaigns in, in, in the uh, Indus River Valley, which is um, in India, and in northern Africa. They encountered and, these dog-headed warriors that they were described as fierce, unstoppable warriors. And King Lycan, that, his, that is where his, his name is where the term lycanthrope came from. Exactly. Uh, sorry, I was trying to catch some of the comments so i mean and i don't know how many times we've said this i kind of feel like i've broken record sometimes but all these when you start looking at like you said the greek and the romans norse mythology native american you know all these prominent cultures had some type of werewolf and Bigfoot, Thunderbird, all, all they had every one of them had these things. Why do you have those if the right? There's you not somebody legends across the globe. Yeah, there's not somebody who's uh, who's out hanging around with these Native American tribes saying, "Hey, you know that's a pretty cool thing. I think I'm gonna go right. back and take that back to the to the Vikings." Well, both uh, Marco Polo and Christopher Columbus in their journals wrote of encountering cynocephali. And cynocephali is just a Latin term. Cephalus means head and cyno means dog. So it's basically head of a dog. Yep. And and like we talked before, Egypt, I mean, Anubis, wet, Anubis, wet. wet. And we've got a whole host of, of, of gods in the Egyptian pantheon with the heads of different animals, even crocodile headed. Yeah, and the, those would be, out, you know, those you know, would being be considered were creatures. I mean, because you look back, look in uh, the Central America, you have were jaguars, you have mm -hmm. stories of that. Uh, like yeah, you said, Jaguarundi, I think they're called. Yeah, Jaguarundi. 
uh, been there's I've heard stories in Africa. Great number of them as well. Yep, I've so, heard stories out of out of Africa about where crocodiles, mm -hmm. which Egypt, right there in it, that you know, uh, what, who is it? Uh, is it Set? Right. This, the yeah. crocodile. Yeah, I believe it was Set. Yeah. So I mean, this all has to come from somewhere. Well, you know, uh, Wepplewet and uh, Nubis both uh, were gods of the underworld. Uh, mm -hmm. Meaning, basically, gods of the dead, um, which maybe maybe that's has something to do with why we still see get, get dogman reports around burial mounds and graveyards. Yeah, just weird coincidence, maybe, but I don't know. There seems to be something to it. I, like I said, I you you don't have this kind of stuff unless these people knew something that we don't know, something that we have either chosen to forget or allowed ourselves to forget or just because it was one of those things that we just didn't want to have any part of anymore that we've just kind of written it out of our history. And, and, you know, all of a sudden, oh, it's just, you know, that's just, you know, we've gotten too smart for our own goods, basically. Oh, that's, that's just old wives tale. That's, you know, that's, yeah. you know, I, when I first really started digging into this, in a, into Dogman, I thought that much like other more primitive cultures trying to explain things, I thought that the werewolf legend just sprang from trying to explain the Dogman, much like the way uh, the, the Vikings used to say that the Northern Lights were the reflections uh, off, of, uh, uh, off of the Valkyrie's armor as they were choos choosing the Fallen, and also the Rainbow Bridge. Uh, that, that that's what, how they explain the rainbow, uh, the, the uh, northern lights. Not saying it's correct, but that's how they explained it. Uh, mm -hmm. So primitive, uh, more primitive cultures that don't understand the scientific side will look for an explanation. And I originally thought that was how they, the you know Middle Ages in Europe during the Dark Ages that they attempted to explain werewolves that they were just cynocephalus. But I, anymore, I don't know. I'm beginning to think that. But that werewolves and, and dogmen are two totally different things. You know, I've I've always kind of theorized that 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 uh, werewolves were could be not necessarily always, but could be more of like a demon type thing. Uh, you know, a lot of demons have that that if they appear to you, they appear as something that that you really fear. And back in those days. Especially in like uh, Germania and uh, countries like that. think about all the wolves that they killed because they were scared to death of wolves in right. Europe and across to that. So where would a lot of that? You know, there was a there was a raging fear of wolves back then. I mean, they were pretty much hunted to extinction in uh, Western Europe and German or Germany and. France and places like that. So, I mean, you know, you get the Beast of Jevedon that killed how many people? Uh, I believe it was over over 200. Yeah, I mean, how many wolves were killed because of that? And, a lot. You know, Peter Stoop, you know. It, so, I think that a werewolf like like we see in the movies, for lack of a better example, you know, that, could, in my opinion, could be more of a spiritual type thing. Mm -hmm. And a dog man would be more of a flesh and blood creature. Right. They just happen to, they just happen to favor have <laughs> some of the same, you know, characteristics. Yeah, characteristics. Uh, Boncho Zorch says, what's the difference between Dogman and a shadow person? How have they been described to you anyway? Uh, shadow persons, I don't think, really are physical creatures. I think they're more more closer to closer related to ghosts, maybe some sort of or uh, like a thought form or a demon. I, I don't know. They're certainly more paranormal. I think Dogman are legit flesh, flesh and blood, blood creatures. Yeah, I... I... I just I think a dog man is just something, and I think that's why you get some of the some of the encounters 
you know, and we've talked about this before, people talk about evil, demonic. They use those terms to describe some, some of these encounters, but you didn't use that term when you described yours. So I think some of these people have seen something is a supernatural, more spirit type thing. Whereas like you, I think you saw a creature. You just saw, you saw an animal. When what I saw, I didn't feel really threatened from. Uh, I kind of got the impression when I saw it, uh, we were having kind of the same thought. I'm like, oh shit, it's a dog man. And it was like, oh shit, it saw me. I, it, it was more concerned with getting the hell out of there than it. I didn't feel like I was being hunted. It was just like, oh shit, it saw me. Uh, you know, because like I said, it was it was just sitting there with its hand against a tree, and it wasn't until it turned its head, watching us slowly drive by, that I caught that little bit of movement and zeroed in on it. And of course, at that point, it was it was it was like once it realized I was looking right at it, and then Nick st you know stopped the car and was looking at it, then it bolted. Uh, but up until that point, it was standing just stock still. So, you know, like we've said, we've said before, you know, we have Hollywood to thank for a lot of the the pictures. In our mind. Yeah, and the misinformation and, and what we think or what we think we know. But even even in that, Look at all the different werewolf movies that are out there, and you don't see hardly any two versions of a werewolf in a movie that look alike, except if you, right. unless you go back to, you know, Werewolves in London and the original werewolf movie with Lon Chaney Jr., those favored. Yeah. That was more, in my opinion, that was more of a wolf man. That was not a werewolf or a dog man. That was a wolf man. That was a man that was cursed to become a wolf versus a werewolf, which turns you more. I think a wolf man was, is more of a tortured soul and can still do, do damage, but a werewolf is more bestial, more animal animalistic, more animal-like, less control, less cognitive thought process in its head whereas a wolfman still has some of that can still think and reason things out and a dogman is just is just an animal period i mean that's just kind of my hypothesis on it i i'm i'm kind of in the same camp as you are uh you know and, and we're we're not going to knock anybody that that has, you know, has uh, has beliefs that are farther farther along the, the, the chain than us it, in the into the area. And I don't know how it got the name the Woo. I really don't. Uh, but people refer to it as the Woo. Um, but Robbie and I were old school cops. Uh, we're we're from back in the day, back in the days of typing out your report longhand. You know, we're old school, and uh, we're I'm we're going to go like with handwriting. What are you talking about? <laughs> Yeah, handwriting tickets. Uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna fall back on um, we're gonna fall back on physical evidence every time until we have to, until we rule it out. I mean, if you went to a crime scene and there was just like you went to an unattended death today, if you went there and found a person dead in their home, the house is locked up, no signs of forced entry, no signs of foul play. If you went, yep. Demon came through a portal and killed him. What's going to happen? She's going to be like, like she's going to be like, yeah, you, I mean, you <laughs> yeah you, you've got to eliminate the most logical explanations before you jump to the really out there. And I'm not saying that it's impossible that, you know, Bigfoot or Dogman go through portals. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying it's impossible they cloak, and I'm not saying it's impossible they mind speak. None of that has been in my experience. Um, the only time I've ever had something kick through the back of my head where, you know, I heard, heard a voice in my head was my own voice, where I was about to go check a building, 
and I called it in and said I was going to check a, check an empty building. And I started in, and that little voice in the back of my head is like, if you go in there, you are going, you are not coming out. And I called for another officer, and we went in. And sure enough, we found a dude inside who would have gotten the drop on me. Um, okay, if I'd have gone in alone, I probably never would have seen him because he was pretty well hidden. Uh, but with two of us, he couldn't he couldn't do it. Uh, so the only time I've experienced what you know, what somebody could even recall called mind speak is my, was literally my own voice. The, I don't know if it's the voice of training or self preservation or my subconscious, whatever you want to call it. But it was just the voice in my head warning me, you know, you're in over your head. Don't go in there. Uh, I, I don't believe that the, the the guy that was hiding in there telepathically told me that. I don't believe that some greater force out in the universe warned me. I just think it was good old ass save and fear. Uh, and, I, and I'm not saying that is in every case. I, you know, there are people that I've talked to that I find to be very credible people that have had this experience. I just have not. Uh, so Robbie and I, uh, and, and Gary too, and even Steve, uh, we're, we're pretty old school on our approach. And we, we will rule out all of the logical explanations before we go to anything beyond that. And I'm not saying that makes us any better or any worse than anybody else. That's just how we do things. Yeah. And like we, we, we say this all the time about not just this topic, but every topic, you know, we're not experts. We're not, and there are no experts because. Right. Exactly. It ain't, it ain't like anybody studied these things. Did my audio just go out? Can you hear me? No, I hear you. Okay. I hear you. It wasn't. There it goes. <laughs> uh, nobody studied these things that we know of. Um, these these are just our ideas and our theories and our speculations on this. It's, but it's like DA said. It's it's what what the evidence has led us to, and so you know anybody out there can believe it anything they, they don't have to believe what we believe you know we're we're not going to be like yeah. you out on a rail because you don't buy into what we this is just us talking and us theorizing and speculating and hypothesizing what we think exactly and roxanne that's called the wolver and yes it, it supposedly you know helps people and protects villages Ugh. yep we I, we actually had, uh, talked about that on the show before, right? But you know, and I guess there are some people who could look at it and say that we're kind of out there when we, we start talking about sort of like demonology and talking about the fact that some of these things could be demons. But you know, I believe in demons. Well, every whether or not you believe, you're a Christian, you believe in the Bible, uh, and, and, and I'm not not gonna start the religious debate but every religion on the planet has a creature that could be described as a demon mm -hmm. uh, in middle eastern philosophy they call it a, call it a jinn which in western we've western society we've kind of devolved that into a genie uh, which is a totally different thing it's more like the disney version of the of the actual jinn legend uh, but they're demon like creatures in every every theology uh, yep. they're just vastly powerful extra dimensional creatures but it doesn't necessarily mean that Bigfoot and Dogmen are that. And I'm not saying they aren't. Uh, and again, like Robbie was saying, we're not experts. We don't claim to be experts. Uh, we make no pretense of being any experts. And if anybody calls us an expert, we're pretty quick to point out, hey, we're, we don't, we're not experts. We don't, there are no experts in this field. If anybody claims they are an expert, they're probably trying to sell you something. But, you know, that's another story entirely. Uh, but you know the, the the fact of it is this is just our opinions uh, based on evidence we've gathered and uh, eyewitness statements and talking you know talking to people in places we've gone and we're not knocking anybody that's had experiences out there in, in what they refer to as the woo we're not knocking that in any way shape or form it just has not been within our wheelhouse. Northwoods on the board again. <laughs> But we get back like like we said. There's there's something in every culture that you can trace back to something like a werewolf, or you know, dog man, wolf, uh, wolf man. You whatever you want to call it, however you want to classify it, 
there's something in almost every culture, every major culture that had something like that. Just like most every culture has something like Bigfoot. Most every culture has some kind of flying demon terror bird, like a thunderbird. Right. Yeah, it's these things are there for a reason. It's not we didn't just come up with these things just to scare our kids into not going in the woods. There's a there's a reason for it. it you know, whether it be the uncanny valley, whether it be you know whatever it, we have these things for a reason. I mean, legends and folklore. You know, before people wrote everything down, I mean, a lot of this stuff was to, told by word of mouth. And, you know, you, some of these things probably got lost in translation and lost over time. But if you start really stacking them up, they, they're all really similar. You know, I mean, whether it be the wolf head nar, whether it be the, the, the werewolf from old Europe, the uh, Ulanga Daglala from... Native American culture, they're all an upright wolf-like creature that will mess you up if you don't if you don't know what you're doing and if you get too close to it. I mean, when you knock it down to brass tacks, that's what it what it what it comes to. Uh, Silver Knight had a question. It says, uh, "Have dogmen and werewolves fought each other before? And also, what are the differences between the two?" Um, you know, I don't know uh, too many accounts where they could di differentiate whether it was a werewolf or a dog man. Um, I've heard William say a, a few things. I don't know if he's still in the chat or not. Uh, but I've heard him say a lot of times dog men usually most of the time have tails. Werewolves don't. Uh, werewolves a lot of times are taller and bigger than dog men. Uh, obviously if a werewolf is a truly a werewolf like we know of, sort of like in the movies or whatever it's all obviously probably going to be a lot stronger and a lot more vicious probably you know whereas i mean it's kind of like comparing a what's a good analogy with that take a real bear and comparing it to you know what was that what was that movie where they uh went inside that bubble and everything was like you know what I'm talking about uh, uh spore not spore but uh spear might have been where they had that some kind of uh bubble formed in the middle of this uh place and they the teams went in and they were in there for years and there was like this big zombie bear and there it was killing people and little fairies and everything just kind of evolved differently. But anyway, it's kind of like saying, okay, you got this regular bear here that, you know, if it's not hungry, it'll leave you alone. But this bear is just like actively hunting everything that moves. Whereas a regular dog man was, is just an animal and it just, it's going to do what an animal does. Whereas a werewolf is going to be actively trying to tear anything apart. It comes across. That made any sense? It made a lot more sense in my head. I, I can't remember. It had a, a, a Natalie Portman in it, and that group of uh, is a the team was all women that went went in at first. Mm -hmm. And Shelly F says annihilation. That might have been it. Maybe I don't have seen it. That sound that sounds right. I'm I'm not a hundred percent, but I think that is it. But Nat, I know Natalie Portman was in it, and had some kind of like zombie bear that was it was actually a really scary scene when it uh, catches them inside this house, and it, just, it you just have to see it. I ain't gonna ruin it for you. I might have to see if I can find that and watch it. Yep, but. You know, like comparing that to a regular bear would I would be what I would say would comparing a dog man to a werewolf is you got an animal that's just doing what an animal does, and then you got this thing that is not a natural occurrence that is just bent on one thing, and that's just total destruction of anything it comes across. 
like I said, it made a lot more sense in my head when I was trying to reason out how to say it, but hopefully that was. John Novak says, yes, it's Annihilation recently on out on Netflix. Very interesting premise. Yeah, it's, a, I mean, I think it's got, if I'm remembering correctly, I think there's, it, it was like alien type stuff in the, towards the end of it. Uh, Roxanne Delgado says, what about the attack of an, of an airman by Whiteman Air Force Base? I read about that. I, I need to get back up by Whiteman and do some checking. Uh, I haven't been up there in, in the last few years, uh, but the, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. That's here in Missouri, Whiteman's an Air Force Base. Uh, there, were two, there were two Air Force Bases here, big ones here in Missouri. Uh, there was Whiteman and Richard Gebauer, and they I believe they closed Richard Gebauer down. Um, but uh, they... Um, the B-1 bombers were at one of those bases. Uh, but apparently what happened with this incident was there was a security detail that patrolled the wire outside of this base. Mm -hmm. And one night, one of the guys uh, was patrolling and they had, had uh, pickup trucks that they patrolled the perimeter in. And he saw something while he was on his patrol. And he described it as its head being level with the window of his truck but it was standing in a ditch about six feet down. So the thing had to be, you know, freaking huge. Uh, and apparently it came after the guy. Uh, I don't remember all the details of this, this, this account. Oh, David Bice says, I think the B2 is still at Whiteman. Um, Northwood two agrees. Uh, but yeah, apparently they came after this guy. And uh, if he hadn't been armed, it probably, he probably would have been dog chow. Uh, he managed to get back to the, the to the rest of the security detail, and they reported it as an exercise. But I don't think anybody really believed it was an exercise. Uh, but you know that guy, that guy came nose to nose with something that you know wasn't supposed to exist, and it changed him. And that unfortunately happens to a lot of folks. Uh, there are people that were diehard. I don't believe in Bigfoot. I don't believe in this. I don't believe in that. Till they run into one. And you know what? Then you can hear the paradigm shifting with a loud pop uh, because it changes their entire worldview. Uh, people that said, oh, that, there's nothing that couldn't possibly exist. Hey, people just people are just lying and trying to get on TV with his stories until they see one. And and then everything changes. And either one of two things happen. Either they become fascinated by the subject or they refuse to talk about it. They don't want to admit it. They don't want to, they don't want to tell anybody about it. They don't want anybody to know they had the sighting. And if you ask them about it, they'll change the subject or deny it. Uh, and I've talked to talked to many people on both sides of that equation. I've had a few people only agreed to tell me their story as long as I kept their name out of it because a couple of them are sitting judges, not in Greene County, but they are sitting judges in, well, let's just say within a couple hours drive of Springfield, Missouri. Uh, I, can't, I can't tell you what county, I won't tell you what county, but two of them are still sitting judges. Well, you know, and I've said that many times. I'm, I'm really glad that I had my encounter at the age I did because it gave me time to adjust. And plus, as a kid, you know, you're a lot more apt to believe stuff and and adjust. If I'd have had this sighting as an adult, you know, I, I, I can't imagine not wanting to go back out in the woods. I mean, I, you know, I love going out in the woods and hanging out and camping and doing stuff like that, you know, but I can't imagine if that had been me where I was like, I ain't going out in the woods no more. So I'm glad I had my sighting at the age that I did where I had time to adjust and could deal with that paradigm shift more than, than having one of those two extremes have to happen. Sorry, I was reading some of the comments. Um, Eric Testament had a good comment. He said, uh, "said I used to fish the ponds off the tank trails on Fort Riley, Kansas. I'd get the feeling I was being stalked, but I couldn't see anything. I thought it was cougars back then, but nowadays I think not. Uh, Northwood says, I've heard that there have been strange encounters on Air Force bases that have occurred around weapon storage facilities. God, dude, Northwoods, do you know how many freaking stories I've heard out of uh, uh, Minot alone? I've, I've probably heard 30 stories just out of Minot, North Dakota. 
Well, yeah, here we go with the, maybe in a broken record again, but these things don't happen, and these stories and these legends are not just told just for the sake of telling them. They're told for a reason. And there's just there's just so much and, and to me this is this is what's what I love about what we do is digging into all these things and looking and finding all these all these common threads and tying all these things together. You know, we've we've joked about it behind the on you know backstage behind this talking about you know it's a good thing we're not one of those that has the red because it would look like a solid red wall with all the the red string behind us with, with <laughs> yeah, exactly. all this stuff that we start tying together. It, it, it's just like the other day when we were talking about the Oklahoma thing when we figured out that on sh on the show that you actually wrote about you know code name Wild Hunt in the exact same area. Where the, the uh, where the Oklahoma Bigfoot War was, Bigfoot War was, and yeah, didn't even realize it. But that, like I said, that to me is what's so fun about this, and it's so interesting and so satisfying all at the same time, is deconstructing this and and figuring out where all the pieces fit. Ronald has says Fort Benning, Georgia, has a lot of activity going on. I've heard a lot of stories out of Fort Benning as well. Uh, actually, I've heard almost as many stories out of Fort Benning as I have out of Fort Leonard Wood. Heard a lot of stories out of Fort Leonard Wood. And speaking of Fort Leonard Wood, uh, when I mentioned him earlier, a uh, guy I went to high school with, his name's Chris. Uh, he's going to join us this Saturday to talk about some of the things that not only uh, has happened on his land currently, but uh, things that him and I both experienced uh, growing up. And uh, he'll be joining us this Saturday. Uh, he's going to be a, a good resource to have on here. I think you guys are going to get a kick out of this one. Um, David By says, DAS, I want to go check that place out. Dude, I can take you to some places within a short drive of Springfield that would curl your hair. There's some places that will freak you out, just the vibe of the place. I oh, think, cool. though, I may have discovered a back way in to that campground that's been bulldozed off. Uh, I, I found something on Google Maps that I think might get me in. I might be able to get in there in my rogue. Uh, so I'm hoping, well, of course, yeah, everybody, you know, you know, uh, this Saturday will be our last show before my vacation. Uh, and we will be gone for two weeks. Uh, we're going to be up in Gatlinburg. Uh, so probably won't have any shows. I might, I might do some like YouTube shorts and stuff, stuff like that. I might drop some videos that I record uh, while I'm out and about up in the mountains up near Gatlinburg. But um, yeah, there won't be any live shows for two weeks. Um, I figure we can do some shorts or something like that while we're oh, yeah. walking around the conference. We can record a bunch of stuff. I want to get get like some short video with like Cam and some of the other folks that'll be there too. Um, David Bice says we got to go. I'll get my pickup running right and take it. Yeah, I want. I'm going to try to get down here. I, I may not be able to do it before the vacation, but I want to get down to Combs Ferry and see if that that road pans out uh, because I feel, it looks like. It, just from the, the Google Maps that somebody has been going through the woods, it looks like like an, either an ATV path or where somebody's been taking a truck back in there. Uh, but if it's not bad, I, I'll risk taking my rogue back in there. Hey, how far are we going to be from the big thicket area when, when we're in Texas in September? A couple hours. Uh, I mean, big thicket ain't too terribly far away. Uh, Jackie Hall says, I have a question. Are there many people that describes a werewolf that looks like a Doberman Pinscher uh, that, that can mind speak? Uh, I've never heard of one described as a Doberman Pinscher. I've heard uh, dogman types that were described as like wolf type. I've heard them described as hyena-like. Um, and as for a mind speak, I really can't say much about about that with, with dogmen. Uh, most of the encounters... Uh, that I've collected over the years don't really involve anything like that. Now there are other other uh, other researchers that have that have got far more experience with that sort of thing than me. Um, Ma uh, Martin Nunnally has experience with that 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 sort of thing. Yeah. Now, Olive Barton, yeah, great dude, great writer, uh, and he's one of those ones. That he he firmly believes in the more woo aspects of things. And I'm not discrediting Bart. I you mean, know, Bart's had some, some fantastic experiences. Uh, I love the guy to death. Him and his wife are just awesome people. And I, I will never say, well, that could have happened to you because I, because it's not been in my experience, 
Bart's, Bart's got some fantastic experiences when it comes to LBL in Kentucky. Probably not many more people with more knowledge than, than Barton Nunnally. Just an absolutely awesome guy. Fantastic writer. His books, if you have not read them, they are just absolutely fantastic. And he's he's got some really interesting experiences out in the woods. Uh, so when it comes to, to dogman type creatures, you might check. Because Barton's got uh, his own his own show. Um yeah, you might uh, you might check in with Barton. Uh, he's probably got more information than I could give you on that. Uh, but I have not heard of a dog man described as looking like a Doberman. Well, we can ask him in a couple of weeks, about sixteen yeah, days. We'll see, we'll see Barton at the uh, at the conference. So maybe I'll 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 uh, set him down in front of the camera and, and ask him. Uh, and Northwood says if you put glasses on a Type Three variant dog man, it would look like my ex. That's funny. Uh, Eric Testerman says Benning is not only a hot spot for cryptid but paranormal as well. I, I'm not surprised. I mean, you know, some of these some of these bases uh, have been there for a long time. I mean, some of some of these bases have a lot of history. And, Benning's not far from me. You no, know, Benning's pretty close. We drove right by Benning when we were going to Myrtle Beach last time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Roxanne says, uh, Roxanne Delgado says, I believe werewolves and dogmen are out there, but more in hiding from humans. I think much like our, well, much like our theory about Bigfoot, I think they're subterranean. I think by and large, they live mostly underground and come up to hunt. I think that's why they're hard to find. I think that's why that they disappear. I, I think that's w why we'll never be able to catch them. Uh, because they're capable of going far deeper underground than we're capable of following, not without a major excursion. Uh, and, and again, I think that's what wood knocks are. I think that's what Bigfoot's wood knocks are. I think it's done with a tongue, and I think it's a form of echo echolocation. Uh, Paul Webb says, Robbie, did you find any more big tracks at your dad's house? I hadn't been back up there. Um, I don't... My dad is, he's one of those, he's always out doing something. So it's <laughs> few and far between when I get to catch him at the ha at his house and actually go up there. But next time I go up there, I'll be, I'll be looking. Uh, Adventures G says Doberman, like an Anubis type dog man. You know, th that makes a certain amount of sense because Anubis are like very short haired, like, like a Doberman. Maybe that could be it, but uh, yeah. I, I don't have a I haven't really collected any accounts of what I would call a Nubis type dog men. Uh, most of the ones I've encountered uh, that I but the, the accounts that I've taken were I've taken a, a more than a handful of of the um, uh, the hyena type and but the most of them are the ones that look like it look like like the werewolf from Van Helsing like a wolf headed creature which is like what I saw, the uh, the one I saw in LBL. It looked very much like the black one uh, that, that uh, Hugh Jackman turned into on Van Helsing, only instead of having a wolf-like narrow snout, it had a shorter, blunter snout, like a like a, like a a mastiff. But it didn't have, like, floppy jaws. It just had a shorter, blunter snout. Eric, I'll look into that since it's not too far from me. I'll look at because I could probably be bending in an hour or two if that. Bob Bear says, might have to drive down and see you. Dude, the uh, the, the uh, event is, what is it, 22nd or the 23rd? 22nd, I think. 22nd. It's a Saturday. Uh, this month, it's a Saturday. It's a one-day event in Gatlinburg, and there's going to be a bunch of us there. Yep. Uh, so, dude, if you're there, come up and introduce yourself. I'd love to actually meet you and shake your hand. And, uh, you know, I don't have, I won't have a booth there. Uh, so, you know, I wasn't able to get a booth for this one. Uh, but I will we'll have some. I'm going to bring a couple of boxes of books and just keep them in the car. Uh, so if anybody runs into me, I'll have books and probably some wild hunt patches with me. Uh, so you know, let me know if you if you're uh, wanting to meet up with that. Uh, and you know, who knows? We uh, Robbie's going to be there. I'm going to be there. So ladies and blondes and blues going to be there. You know, maybe we can do uh, you know an after the after the show kind of thing where a bunch of us sit down and and uh, have dinner somewhere or grab a burger and sit and just talk about this kind of stuff. I think it'd be great to do it live with a bunch of folks.
uh, David By says, DA, we still need to do that experiment during the day. Yeah, I definitely want to try that during the day. Uh, there are a lot of things I want to do. Yeah. Josh Dalton says you're politically incorrect. It's Fort Moore now. It's always going to be Benning. To anybody that served, it's going to be Benning. And that's not because of because of who Benning was in life. It's because that, fo that fort has been Fort Benning for 100 years. Uh, people are always going to call it Fort Benning. Uh, just like just down the road from here, here uh, uh, this is part of the origin of the book, The Lakeview Man. Uh, just down by Kimberling City, between Kimberling City and Branson, is a town that is now called Branson West. When Branson started getting popular in the mid-90s, for some reason, the town of Board of Aldermen and the mayor of that little town changed the name of the town to Branson West to capitalize off the tourism in Branson. Before that, the town was called Lakeview. And that is part of where the Lakeview Man comes from. The other part is there was a song by a band that Chris and I both really liked called The Rainmakers. And I don't know if you all saw the video I posted, but we went and saw them last year live. And I gave them a copy of the Lakeview Man book. Uh, they're a rock band from here in Missouri. They're from up near Kansas City. They also have a song called The Lakeview Man. And if you ever hear that song, you're going to know what, what inspired that book. Uh, really cool song, very creepy song. Um, the, the opening lyrics of the song says, Betty called the sheriff and said, come quick. Somebody broke in my freezer and stole all my steaks. The dog is still hiding. The sheriff said, ma'am, sounds to me like the Lakeview Man. And it just uh, it just gets crazy from there. Lakeview Man is a wild man. Lives in the woods outside of town. Howls at the moon. Listen if you can, and you might hear the Lakeview Man. And when I heard that song, that town was still called Lakeview. And I got the heebie-jeebies every time I drove through that town because that area, well, it's a little more grown up now. But when you get down to that area around Table Rock Lake in the, in the mid-90s, that area was still wild and woolly and parts of it still are to this day. Sorry, trying to catch up with some of the comments. Uh, Daniel Hoyle says, "Da like a roddy snout." Yeah, you know, narrower and blunter. Like you know, like I I I described it as mastiff like because I had mastiffs. Uh, it was a lot like my bull mastiffs, but he didn't have the big big floppy jaws. Uh, yeah, I could see it be very much like a like a like a Rottweiler. It other than that, it looked like the head of a wolf, uh, but the snout was was shorter and wider. It didn't have that that narrow, almost angular snout of most wolves. Sorry, I'm trying to catch up. Uh, Roxanne Delgado says, my uncle told me long ago he believes some dogmen sightings are from people who have done really wrong in their lifetime. He said that he called a woman an Ozark witch, told him that. You know, I, and I won't dispute that. I mean, I'm not going to go, oh, no, 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 I couldn't be. You know, that, that's never, you're not going to catch us, you know, trying to downplay you know, le uh, legends and folklore, because all that folklore, it's got some kernel of truth to it. That Those stories didn't just spring from nothing. Those stories got, there's something about them. And even the origin stories, one of the origin stories of the creature in LBL was of, uh, of I believe it was a Choctaw shaman who, uh, who, did, who did evil and was cursed to be locked in this wolf form. Uh, so, you know, I won't, I won't dismiss Native American lore ever. Uh, because, you know, there's always something to it. It may not be, you know, it may not be 100% right, uh, but there's enough right where you can see where the, where the story came from. Uh, so, you know, there's there's definitely more going on in this world that we will probably ever truly know. Uh, Brandon says, uh, at DA, hopefully talking to an artist tomorrow on a design. Uh, I must have missed an earlier comment. Brandon, I'm sorry. I've been trying to catch... Catch comments. What did I miss there on? I I I don't know. I'm completely lost. Uh, if I missed comments, folks, I'm so sorry. Their comments are flying so fast. There's 214 people watching, and awesome, folks. Thank you guys for joining us. 
Uh, we are so glad to have you guys. Let, let's take a quick break. I'm not quite ready to stop because we haven't ready, haven't really covered all of the World War II stuff, unless you need to, Robbie. Robbie, I can't hear you. Oh, Robbie will be right back. While Robbie's coming back, let's uh let's see if we can get this video to play from Carrie over at Dark Angel. Hey everybody, this is Carrie Pocket Doc Davis from Dark Angel Medical, and you are listening to DA X Machina with DA Roberts. You may recognize me or some of my products from Dark Angel Medical in some of the Apex Predator, Lakeview Man, and Wild Hunt books. And you can get those products at www.darkangelmedical.com along with training classes on how to use those products and save a life. Shoot us an email at info at darkangelmedical.com and be the difference. Sorry about that, folks. The video would, did not play. The audio played, but the video didn't. Um, I'll uh, just throw that up here for just a second. Uh, folks, go ahead and you know, check out Dark Angel Medical. Uh, Carrie's a good friend of mine. It's a veteran-owned company. Carrie, Carrie's a combat veteran. He was a he was a he was a special forces air, uh, flight medic. Uh, did did his time in the, in the sandbox. He's 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 been there, done that, and got a whole closet full of t-shirts. Um, Dark Angel Medical was a company that was founded to help veterans and first responders and others, but with life-saving equipment. I carried one of Dark Angel's medical kits throughout my law enforcement career. The bulk of it, uh, just absolutely the best kits in the business. Uh, and if you're going to be doing anything out in the woods away from basic 911 services, a medical kit, a good medical kit is a must. And knowing how to use it is worth it, is, is beyond measure of the, the, the value of that. Because the life you save could be that, that of your, yourself or someone you love. Uh, so head out to Dark Angel Medical, check them out, and use discount code CRYPTID25 for 25% off your entire order. Sorry, I'm catching up on some co other comments. Robbie, while I'm catching up on the comments, you want to tell us a little bit about Scallywag Tactical? Sure thing. Scallywag Tactical, like DA said, with uh, Dark Angel Medical is another veteran-owned company. You're, those of you who read the books have probably seen or heard of all the knives that uh, most of the guys from the Wild Hunt carry. Um, the Bounty, the Gunner's Mate, uh, Boarding Axe, the what else is in there uh i think mini jack is that in there the privateer excuse me the privateer that's what clark carries yeah is his uh little pocket knife these are some of the best knives folders fixed blades anything that'd be the privateer that's what clark carries in his pocket this thing is wicked sharp too so yeah you know that's almost like a scalpel i have not done anything with it as the dew claw like I said, they've got some of the best I, the names are cool as all get out anyway but the knives themselves you're not going to go and spend three or four hundred dollars on uh is that the transformer transformer the really cool aspect about this is it's got a little lock on it by the thumb you hit that and it turns it into a, a punch dagger See, I mean, how cool is that, the Transformer? Pretty freaking cool. You're not going to go and spend any more money on some of these bigger name knives, Benchmade, uh, Kershaw, Spyderco, which you're going you're gonna to pay for, you know, you know three, four $400 for a pocket knife, but they're not going to be any better than any of these knives right here. Was that the Mako? Yeah, that's the Mako. Yeah, that one. I wish I'd have got that one before they went. That's a nice one. Yep. But yeah, it just the quality of these knives is just remarkable. I mean, they're they're sharp. They come to you sharp. They stay sharp. And as me and Doc like to say, they'll cut you three ways: long, deep, and continuous. So that they would definitely win. To piggyback off. If you're going to get you a scallywag tactical knife, you probably need to get you a, a Dark Angel medical kit to Just protect yourself when you cut yourself with your scallywag tactical knife because that's inevitably going to happen. DA this one's called Razor. Razor. Yep, that's the new one. Look how thick that son of a gun is. That's an impact weapon. It's heavy. Uh, 
DA and I hold the distinct uh, title of idiots that have both cut ourselves on on the show with our scallywag tactical knives. DA trying to shave his arm to show how sharp it was. Me just because I dropped it and tried to catch it with my freaking bare hands like an idiot. I know, never been accused of being the sharpest knife in a drawer. Although these are. See what I did yeah, there? they are. <laughs> so, they also got the, the section called Blemish Blades. This was on the Blemish Blades. There's, this is a $45 knife, and I got it for $15. It was the box. That was what was wrong with it. I think DA showed one knife that had a little scuff or uh, smudge on it. Nothing wrong with the knife. And there's the yes word. That's the bounty. Everybody on Team Odin carries one of these. I'm thinking about getting the uh, Wild Hunt logo laser engraved on the blade. I think that would be cool. But uh, go check out the Blemish Blades. See what they got. If you like anything on the Blemish Blades, put them in there. Use code DA Roberts 10 at checkout regardless. But even on the Blemish Blades, which are majorly uh, discounted blades, that code will still work on those two. It'll stack up, and you'll save a lot of money. Uh, David, buy this one. Is this the one you're talking about? This is called the this is called the razor, the razor folder, and it's one of the ones I just got. Uh, really like this thing. It's super heavy for a pocket knife. It is really heavy, but I've started carrying it. Um, it's part of my EDCs just because I really like the feeling of it in my hand. And whereas a good, good pocket knife is good for anything, I honestly think if I really needed to in a survival situation, I could take a limb off a tree with this thing by hacking it. This thing is just wicked, stupid sharp, and it is so thick and heavy. I think that this thing could be used, like Robbie was saying, as an impact weapon, not just as an edge weapon. And, you know, I, I use my, my dew claw as my camp knife for – for breaking stuff like that hack and so if that thing is is as heavy as like the dew claw which da can take because he's got both of them then i would say yeah you could probably use that to take limbs off a tree but craig's a great guy he's a veteran he stands by his uh by his work and they don't just have knives even though they've got all kinds of knives they've got all kinds of scally swag they've got Look at that. Whiskey glasses. This is, a, this is an Italian crystal. Oh, I love this thing. It's my my new favorite whiskey glass. And I got, got this. Glass. I've got three or four scallywag hats. I got uh, another whiskey flask. This one's all glass. And this is like etched in there. I don't know if they use acid or, or sandblasting. But it's 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 etched into the glass a good millimeter and a half. I mean, you can feel the raised edges, uh, so it's not like it's going to come off in the dishwasher. Um, they have great hats, great T-shirts, uh, you know, really cool patches. Uh, I think oh, yeah, I've got one of the patches right here. Um, this is one of those PVC patches. Uh, their patches are like six or seven bucks. Uh, they've got this one and another one that's a green flag with the Scallywag logo in the middle of it. Uh, really cool patches. Uh, and you always so, get a cool yeah. thing of stickers when you get your uh well I've got a stack of them stickers. Yeah. I got a book of them of stickers. Yep. I always get a cool pack of stickers when you get the put on stuff. I've got them on my toolboxes out in the shop. So go check them out. Get you a good I got I got so many of them stickers. I'm probably gonna bring most of those with me to the uh the 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 Bigfoot conference and just hand them out. Because yeah, I, I I've got a ton of them. Yep, I'm sure you do. <laughs> you could probably cut them, cut them into individuals, and then you could, you could hand out individual stickers all day long. Probably could. I could probably hand out a bunch of them. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. There's seven per sheet, and I probably got a dozen sheets. So go check them out. Great company. Uh, use code DA Roberts ten at checkout. Get yourself some the money out that way they know that we sent you and that's all i got to say about that before we talk about ken 
I want to answer this question. Uh, John Novak says, uh, replying due to the comment lost in the sauce, does it seem there's a more is a concentration of sightings around military bases, especially secluded ones? If so, any theory on why? I do have a theory on that because most military bases, including Fort Benning, I don't know what, I don't know what it's called now, but it's always going to be Fort Benning to me, Fort Leonard Wood, a lot of Fort uh, uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord. Most of these bases aren't just the buildings of the base. Fort Leonard Wood is 25,000 acres, most of it wooded. Uh, those, those are just like national parks. They're areas where people aren't allowed to go. Uh, so these it's prime habitat. Uh, they, they know they're not going to be hunted there because you're not allowed to hunt on military bases. Uh, the only thing they're going to have to worry about is, is troop uh, trainings, training areas, and they know they're probably not going to run into troops out in the deep woods. They're going to be in their bivouac sites. They're going to be on ranges. They're going to be near the buildings. They're going to be near marked trails. Uh, so I think there's a very re really uh, clear area for these things to exist on on bases like Fort Leonard Wood, Fort Benning, Fort Jackson, Fort Stewart, Georgia, uh, Fort Greeley, Alaska, because these these bases, most of them are between 20 and 30,000 acres of yeah. protected well, land. There's there's sightings of uh, Bigfoot and of Dogman on in, uh, Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. There sure is. And Lejeune's a big base too, I believe. Lejeune is another big base. Most of those military bases, like I said, they're not just the buildings and the ranges. They're 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 thousands upon thousands of acres. Twenty nine palms. I mean, granted, it's desert, but it's still huge. Oh yeah. Um, so I don't. Uh, so we don't leave out Ken. Don't want our, our, don't want the tactical Smurf to feel left out. Uh, Ken Brock is another good dude. He's uh, he's you know law enforcement. Been his career, spent his career in law enforcement. He makes custom blade knives, custom made knives. Uh, this one here, uh, Carrie's not here to show his off, but this one's called the Skane Do, uh, which is a Scottish dagger. It means black blade. It was a holdout knife carried by the Highlanders, usually concealed in a sock. Uh, but that's just a great little everyday carry knife. It's uh, mine. The one he made me is titanium bladed. Uh, it's it's a just a great little all around universal little tool, uh, great knife, good one to have. And if you're looking for a great gift for somebody you know that's an outdoorsman or works in first works as a first responder, law enforcement, military, anything like that, uh, a good knife is an absolute treasure. Uh, especially if it's a knife that doesn't just look pretty; it's something that can be used. And Ken's blades are made to be used. Uh, they're all hand forged. They're all custom made to order. Uh, no two will be identical. Uh, so you check check all of Ken's blades over at brockblades.com and mention that you heard about him here on DAX Machina for 10% off your entire order. And uh, tell him we sent you. And that's all i got to say about that. That's all we got to say about the tactical smurf. That's right. Poncho says, I'm saving for a Brock blade. I, I can't wait till I, I get my Ardennes from, from Ken. I mean, I, I'm, I'm so stoked about that. That's probably going to be, become one of my, my you know, take it with me everywhere. Yeah, uh, I've got a go bag for any time I go out. Uh, I've got a, uh, I bought, got, I bought a, a new bag for my camera, for my DSLR camera. Uh, and it's got room for other gear in it. It's a good size bag. And I'm probably going to put that Ardennes on, on the mount it to the strap of that bag. Cause it's a, it's a, uh, over the across the shoulder and also locks around the waist bag. So I, I want some extra gear other than just photography stuff in it. Uh, Eric Testament says, in, in the Marines, our knives are our best friend. I feel naked when I don't have one on me. Dude, if I'm awake and I'm dressed, I got a knife on me. Uh, I, I, I generally more than one because uh, knives are just such a great tool. I mean, you know, it's, it, it used to be a kind of a running joke with people that knew me like, hey, you got a knife on you? Yeah, what are you cutting? Like, just do you have a knife? No, it depends on what you're cutting. You know, I, which knife I give you will depend on what you're cutting. I don't want you cutting wire with my good knife. Uh, David Bice says, DA, did you get a GoPro type camera? Yeah. Um, actually, this was a gift from Meg, who's uh, one of the one of the mods. It's a GoPro Hero 4. This is a great little camera, and it's the one I put on my back when I go out in the field. Um, don't worry, we're going to be doing a lot more field work now that I got that DSLR. Um, let's 
Josh Dalton says D A and see if you could get the Ardennes with a D guard. Um, Ken and I already, already talked about the design of the one I want. I'm, I'm pretty happy with with what I picked. I can't wait to see it. It's going to be badass. Uh, Northwood says when I get my expensive blades later this year, I'll send some pictures. I'd love to see them, dude. Uh, Brock Blades has some new blades on their site. Yeah, head over to Brock Blades and check out all the new stuff. Um, thanks, Tombs. Uh, I got a really wicked good deal on that DSLR. I'm so so excited. Uh, it's a it's it's not a brand new camera. It's a refurb from Canon. Uh, so I got it for like a third what they sell for, and I, I had to save up for a bit to get it. But it was so nice to have a DSLR. Uh, I think we're caught up on that. Um, yep. Now back to back to the the World War II werewolf stuff. Uh, Robbie, you you uh, found some printout stuff uh, that during during the, the toward the end the closing days of World War II, there was a group a group of uh, shall we say the losing side of World War II. Uh, we don't need to drop the nationalist national socialist full tie, uh, full nickname, uh, but. Uh, yeah, they uh, they had a group that called themselves the Werewolves, and it's kind of yep. up in the air whether or not they really were. Robbie, you want to tell us a little bit about them? Yep. <clears throat> I'll just I'll read you a little bit of this excerpt here. Uh, American intelligence officer Frank Manuel uh, started seeing a certain symbol near the end of, end, of, end of World War II etched across white walls in the Franconi region of Germany. A straight vertical line intersected by a horizontal line with a hook on both ends. And a lot of people at first were thinking it was a hastily drawn swastika that was interrupted. You know, like they started and somebody saw them and they ran off. Um, but most members of the counterintelligence corps were the opinion that it was merely a hastily drawn swastika. Uh, Manuel wrote in a memoir, but Manuel knew otherwise. To him, the mark referred to as the werewolves uh, were a German guerrilla fighting group the, uh, prepared to strike down the isolated soldiers in his jeep and the MP on patrol or the fool who goes courting after dark, uh, the Yankee braggart who uh, takes a back road. So basically what these guys were, and we're saying guys right now because, you know, I'll get to a little bit of that later. They were not really a guerrilla group because the war was pretty much over at the time that this stuff started. This was a group of terrorists, basically, who their sole purpose was to just cause as much damage to the Allied forces as they possibly could. They knew it wasn't going to help this help the war. They were not trying to help the war effort or trying to win. The, they were just trying to do as much damage as physically possible as they that they could do. So they were, like it said, you know, if they ca caught a patrol that was, you know, out by themselves, they were taking them and a lot of times tearing them to pieces, doing things that were just not the normal wartime things to do to people. So the legend, I don't know if you want to call it a legend or if you want to say the rumor or whatever, you know, it started being put out there that maybe there really was uh, werewolves out there. So they kind of started, this group leaned into that and started, I guess, kind of like the Navy SEALs did in uh, Vietnam when they first started, when they were being called the Green Demons and the, the men in green faces, and they just really leaned into that, those scare tactics. That's the same thing this group did. They really leaned into those scare tactics and uh, used that to kind of fuel that word i'm looking for the i don't want to say it was terror but they they lean into using that to kind of help uh really push their narrative of what they were trying to do 
right. forward. So well, you know, you inspire fear in an enemy. You know that uh, you know that that goes far better than even you know the stories that get circulated of you usually outdo what you've actually even done. Uh, so you know you have to inspire that much extra fear in an enemy. Uh, you know half your battles already beaten, already won. Yeah. If if they're already afraid of you before you even get there. And that that's the same like the example I use with the Navy SEALs. That's you know half the time the uh, Viet Cong was already so scared of them they really didn't have much to do because they were they come out of the jungle with their green faces and they were like and that was it so that's and you know maybe they learned something from from these werewolves but like i said they they really leaned heavily into that that narrative of people because i'm sure a lot of the natives of the cut i'm sure they helped out with a lot of that because they were you know they didn't just target military people they targeted anybody that you know was you know if they were known to aid the allies they were targets too because exactly. this was like i said this was not they didn't they didn't play by the uh rules of the geneva convention or any of that stuff they 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 were terrorists they were not a and they were a military organization they were but they were not a military organization. They didn't play by the same rules, didn't have to play by the same rules. They just did pretty much whatever they wanted to do. And it's pretty freaking scary when, or when you start getting into reading this whole article about some of the stuff they did and how they did it. Um, And they didn't care what it, it There was like no area of operation. I mean, they did wherever they could, could find a target of interest. That's where they went. Yeah. That's a fact. Uh, but, you know, the, the, one of the, the creepier parts about that story is, is there's conjecture on whether or not some of them really might have been. Well, um, and you, you, we've talked about it before, all the experiments that, that, that <laughs> the German army was doing. Maybe that's where some of that speculation came from, and maybe that's why they really leaned into it. Because there were there were some, if you look at some of the retellings of what happened to some of the people that they attacked, almost kind of leans back to what your story was at first. With, right. That some of these people were right, torn apart. Yeah. So, w was it all just propaganda? Were there really, you know, possibly crudely genetically modified werewolf type soldiers? Could have been. We know they they were trying to do experiments on turning people into uh, or kind of, not turn them into, but kind of make them like you had in your book. Yeah, they were them trying into, to into sharks or great white sharks or whatever. That's you know Peter Benchley based his book uh, White Shark on that mm -hmm. that experimentation. Hey, yeah, that's exactly what that was all based on. Really good, good book too. Um, there's there's a lot to be said about what did they really do, and when they knew they were losing, what did they just release? Yeah. So the story of these werewolf attacks might not be as far fetched as people think. Yep, Tombs, you got it right. I mean, that's that's exactly. And if you think back and start looking at some of the comic books back then and things they were, I don't think Stan Lee and a lot of these guys were just that creative that they just came up with these ideas just off the top of their head. A lot of that stuff was, is probably pretty spot on as to what was going on. I mean, we know for a fact Hitler was looking for the spear of destiny. He was looking for the Holy grail. Well, there was a, they had a, the, 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 their team, the Honor Nerva, they had teams all over the world looking for holy artifacts and magical artifacts and anything they thought could help turn the tide of the war. So, but if you, if you know for a fact that, that that stuff was going on, then look at, look at Hydra in the, in Marvel, what the, and, and that's basically the kind of stuff that you're looking for, you know, the Tesseract and all that stuff from Odin's throne room you know 
it ain't that far fetched when you start looking at. We know that they were actually looking for these artifacts. So if they were looking for these artifacts, how do we know they weren't looking for these other artifacts? And that's just so these comic books, instead of being completely fiction, they become more yeah, of a like a, a science fiction version yeah. of what's really happening. A pseudo history. I mean, right. Or if nothing, a, a more uh, fictionalized version of what was really happening. Right. I mean, and we know that they, they actually were trying to make super soldiers. Oh, yeah. And so, I, mean, I think they still are. Yeah. So that part, that part of the comics are, are true. You know, the only part we don't know for sure if, is true or not is if if we turned around and tried to tried to mimic that i mean which i'm sure we probably did knowing us but like i said the government our government they may not have created dog man but they're not above manipulating trying to manipulate one into a weapon and what's what's that old saying truth is always stranger than fiction yeah that's a fact and that's that's not the only incidents of things like that Supposedly, uh, in the mountains between Poland and Romania, uh, supposedly there was a, a German unit that was attacked by werewolves and fell back after losing several people. Uh, these are these are just weird little stories from World War II that crop up. Some of them in books uh, that I've read over the years. Some of them from from other sources, and some of them I found online. Uh, but that, that's not just the the only stories of cryptids being involved in war. I mean, look at the Civil War. Old, uh, old Green Eyes from the Battle of Chickamauga, uh, which descriptions from both sides of the war that were actually put in officers' reports were of this green-eyed creature that would come out on the battlefield and carry off the wounded and the dead. Yeah. Some versions of the story is more of a ghost story where they think it was the disembodied spirit of somebody who had killed who was killed on the battlefield, but others described it as being a Bigfoot-like creature that was carrying off people. Some of them are not dead yet. <coughs> so I mean, we know how how crazy they really or they were that just from what we've heard. But like you said, what did we not hear? Right. And, and what, what what thing what kind of things may we never hear? Yeah, and what things did like you said did they just say? Ah, oh, well, the war's over. Well, look at look at the, the Lewis and Clark expedition. Parts of the Lewis and Clark journal are still classified. If they're still classifying stuff from before before the the the, the Civil War, what what's what are they not telling us about more recent wars like World War One, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam, the the war in Afghanistan. I mean, we know from for a fact that that C-130 crew crewmen have seen giant, like Bigfoot type creatures on thermals as they were leaving military bases in Afghanistan. Uh, Kerry knows a guy who saw it firsthand. Um, you know, so you know, we, we our government is real big on not telling us about stuff like this, and they've known about these things for a very long time. Uh, I think you know my Teddy Roosevelt theory holds a lot of water. Oh yeah, I hundred percent agree. Uh, Roxanne Delgado says, where, "DA, where the bodies ever found? Uh, which which incident? Uh, because the uh, the one in Finland, yes, they found a lot of shredded bodies. Uh, and in the cases of the of the werewolves that were attacking allied allied soldiers, yes, they found a lot of bodies. Uh, but the the one I heard about in the in the mountains between Romania and Poland, I don't think they'd ever said they recovered the bodies." Um, Show me Moses, a version of meth was invented in World War II. Yeah, well, that's how Blitzkrieg was fueled. Uh, mm -hmm. That's how, that's how the, the Germans kept their soldiers awake and moving for days uh, because they created a primitive form of, of methamphetamine that kept their troops moving. Um, J.D. Smooth says, D.A., do you, do you think they are more, popula more populated than, than Bigfoot? Seems more dogmen than Bigfoot. I don't know. I think... If anything, I think there would probably be more Bigfoot than Dogmen, but that's just me uh, because we've been seeing Bigfoot a lot longer. Uh, but and Bigfoot is is many times seen in groups. Uh, I don't think I've I know but but a handful of Dogman stories where more than one was seen at a time. <laughs> Poncho Zort says, if you ever find an odd, odd or strange skeleton, do not let the Smithsonian in on it. 
bet absolutely yeah the last person i'm calling is the smithsonian uh Sorry, I was trying to catch up. I know I missed a bunch of comments. Yeah. Uh, I just yeah. Miss Lene's calling her tonight. Have a good night, Miss Lene. Thank you for being here. Now, Miss Lene. I mean, we can sit here and like I said, what if all these scenarios all night long? Well, the fact of the matter is there was a lot of stuff that they did that Number one went way outside of any kind of regulation or Geneva Convention, which I know the Geneva Convention was not really prevalent at that time. But there's there's so much that, like you said, we'll never know that they did. I mean, I would think there's probably most of the German government right now probably has no clue what they even did during that time because right. some of that stuff is just is just lost to, to time because it died with the third reich and i mean i'm sure there's still records of it somewhere somewhere or somewhere with someone but the chances of us, if, if as many of them escaped to argentina and south america like they think yeah but the chances of us knowing the extent of what they actually did do or try and that, I don't know what's scarier to think of what they tried or what what they actually succeeded with. I don't know what's scarier to think about, but I'm sure there was as many failures as successes. Failures as successes. Probably far more of my failures than successes. Right. But those failures could have been, <laughs> you know, could have been stuff that not in just because it's a failure doesn't mean it it died. I mean, it could be something right. that just didn't didn't turn out the way they wanted it to. So, ah, it's a failure, and they turn it loose. So, I mean, you know, a lot of this stuff that we see and hear about could be some of that stuff. Yeah, it could explain a, a great deal that we've you know we'll, that we may never know, uh, but a lot of mysteries that surrounded, like even the rock apes of Vietnam. Um, the the green old green eyes of the Chickamauga, the werewolves of World War II. Um, how many of these things could be explained if you know the real the real story was ever truly brought to light? Could these things have been cryptids? We may never know. Um, it, but I know in one particular case, the case in that started all this all the whole show, the case in Finland. I truly think there's something in that valley. I would love to be able to go there one day and, and, and put that to the theory. But, you know, even almost a hundred years, well, actually it's over a hundred years. So 19, no, 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 it's not coming up on a hundred years, 1939. Even then, even almost a hundred years later, the Finns are still saying it wasn't them. Like Robbie said, why wouldn't they brag about kicking the Russians butts? Why wouldn't they say, yeah, that was our military that took you down. They, even the Finns were like, we didn't do that and we don't go there. There are yeah, dangerous things in that valley. I think that's so telling that they, even to this day, don't take credit for that. Or like, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, don't blame us for that. We didn't do it. And I don't think it's because they're worried about retribution or retaliation, especially at this point. Right. You know, yeah, maybe. There'd be it, no living at all could be associated with it. You know, maybe at some point when it, you know, was fresh. Okay, I can maybe see, but even even so, you know, if you're in that situation and they, I mean, because how much of a morale boost is that going to be to say, yeah, we, you know, we we just took out one of their elite special forces units. Roxanne Delgado says the natives that live at the bottom of the mountain told them not to go. Roxanne, if you don't mind, would you send me the the, the, the link to what you found? Uh, because I, I I think that that actually expands even more on what I've already read. 
Uh, so if you could, we don't mind sending that to me. I would love to to go over that and add that to my notes. Uh, because honestly, I think that's going to come into uh, a future book at some point. Um, and, uh, you know, Roxanne, if you want to reach out to me with that, it's daroberts at daroberts.net. I would really appreciate it. Uh, Show Me Mo says, again, the story of the truce uh, from they call wolves attacking soldiers as they ate the dead and wounded, first got a taste and went to, went to live soldiers. That happened in World War I during uh, the trench warfare. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, apparently, they, the Germans and allied troops had to band together to fight bands of wolves that were coming out into no man's land and yep. out in the dead. And that was the trench wolves, right? The trench wolves. Yeah. In fact, uh, you know, that's, I think that was one of the reasons the trench gun was invented, not just to, to kill enemy soldiers, but to kill things that got into the trenches. I, I'd, I'd, like, yeah, I I'd like to get one of those old original world one, world war one trench guns with the, the slam fire. You just hold the trigger down to keep jacking that the, the pump. Yep. That, that'll so, clear some wounds. Scott's got a video about the Kentucky ballistics. He's got a mm -hmm. video on the couple of slam fires. My my uh my my son was saying, you know, probably wouldn't be that hard to modify the KSG. I'm like, no, 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 we're not doing any modifications. No, no, we are not changing anything. Nope. It'd be cool to buy one that's already like that, but I'm not doing anything that's going to get me, you know, under a watch list. No. Nah. Not that I'm probably not already, because I'm a I'm a amateur crypto cryptozoologist, a cryptozoologist and writer. Some of the stuff I've Googled alone while researching books has probably gotten people scratching their head trying to figure out what the hell I'm doing. Uh, Roxanne says, DA on YouTube, Forgotten History has a video on that, about 15 minutes long. I'll check that out. Thank you. Um, Corey Cole says, I heard a rumor of a truce between the soldiers and the werewolves. Would not surprise me. Because these things, if they're anything like dogmen, they're very intelligent. They're just very, very vicious. Um, Robbie, do you have to work tomorrow? Yep. All right. Well, let, let's start winding things down. Let's start the Ozarks. Good evening. Because I don't want to keep you up super late. If you've got to be up at four. So uh, let's let's start winding things down. We've covered all of our 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 uh, our uh, affiliates. So make sure you check out you know Scallywag Tactical, Dark Angel Medical, and Ken Brock. Rockblades.com, ScallywagTactical.com, and DarkAngelMedical.com. Tell them we sent you. Uh, you guys can can find the uh, the discount codes in the earlier chat, or uh, if you uh, prefer, it's Cryptid25 for Dark Angel Medical. It's DA Roberts10 for uh, Scallywag Tactical, and for Ken, just let them know that uh, that we sent you. Um, folks, thank you guys for hanging out with us. You know, we have we 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 maintained well over 200 people for most of the show. We're still at 181, uh, which is just absolutely awesome. We we appreciate you guys hanging out with us. Don't forget this Saturday, um, I'm gonna have uh, someone telling uh, telling some stories from here in Missouri that involved me when I was a much younger man, and uh, we're we're gonna have a good time. Uh, but uh, this Saturday will be the last show for two weeks. Uh, we're gonna it's my 30th anniversary. Uh, we're we're gonna be taking some time to me and the wife to celebrate our 30 years together. And we're going to be up in the mountains, up in up near Gatlinburg. Uh, but if you're going to be at the, uh, the Gatlinburg Bigfoot conference on July 22nd, Saturday, uh, we you'll, you'll, I'm sure you'll find us there along with Robbie Rip Rains and a whole host of other people. Barton Nunley and his wife will be there. The ladies from blondes and booze will be there. Uh, Cam Buckner is supposed to be there. Um, a lot of a lot of good folks going to be there. So Donna Boss will be there. Donna Boss will be there. Uh, Jessica from Cryptid Huntress. I hope she'll be there. Haven't haven't heard from her, but hopefully she will be. Poncho says July twenty second going to be in Tulsa. Sorry, man. Would love, would have been nice to see you there. Maybe the next one. Um, Penny Vance says, "Oh no, DA show on my birthday." Then sorry about that. Uh, but I am going to be shooting some video with that new DSLR camera. Uh, I'm going to be shooting some interesting videos, and we'll probably sit down with Robbie and and a few others, and and do a, not a, not only some interviews, but some kind of candid stuff with some of the uh, the names that are going to be at the con the conference. Um, probably not any of the guests that are up on stage. I'm not buying a VIP VIP pass, and well, uh, there's really not 
I won't say anything bad. I'll be nice. I, uh, I, 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 let's just say I'm not going to see the guests. I'm going to see the people that are going to be there. Um, lost my train of thought completely. I do that once in a while. Yeah. But it's a small know. train on spur. Uh, Roxanne says, DA, have you thought about doing a weekend thing in the Mark Twain Forest? Yes. Uh, we, Robbie and I would have talked about that. We've discussed that a couple of times. If I can find a place where, even if it's just primitive camping, uh, hopefully someplace with, with uh, cabins because I don't I do not do sleeping on the ground anymore because of my back. Uh, but, uh, you know, hopefully we can find a place where we can, we're going to shoot for some time next year, but we, we are going to find a place where we can get a, uh, an entire campground for three, four, maybe even five days. Uh, where we can do some 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 casting classes and evidence collection classes and Doc can do some first aid classes and and just a, you know we, we one of those situations where you don't just come to come to get lectured to you come to hang out with folks and and hopefully leave with some skills that'll help you and again we don't claim to be experts folks uh, we just we are very happy to share the knowledge that we do have uh, and if whether you agree with us or disagree with us that is perfectly fine. Again, we make no claims of being any kind of expert in this field, and there are no experts in this field. So don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Um, we uh, we just enjoy what we do, and we enjoy bringing this 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 podcast to y'all. Uh, so we have a good time doing it. And uh, Robbie, before we go, tell us a little bit about uh, about your podcast. Ah, uh, what's really out there? Dax mocking a like <laughs> for a. Those of you who don't want a full three and a half hours or two and a half hours or whatever, you get like 30 minutes to 45 minutes. Um, just had an episode drop today, I believe, Dogman 101. Where Good we, episode. Yep, yeah, appreciate it. We you know, just kind of just talk a little bit about, um, you know, it's like some of the questions now are people asking the difference between Dogman or Wolfman, Werewolf, things like that. Just, you know, just kind of a little informative show uh next wednesday though is the is the one that i've been waiting to drop it's going to be uh as i titled it or uh, described it new information on the old classic it's our episode about the patterson gimlin and mk davis's new uh info on the pick that was that they've had uh redone with whatever that uh red filter or whatever it's called uh but i'm kind of excited for that one that's that's a pretty good episode uh I check to mk on and just do a show yeah. about that yeah and I, I i think that would be a good one because that that picture is just amazing you know you know we, we just talk about an audio version on ours but to get him on here and put that picture on here would be amazing uh but that comes out next Wednesday at 8 a.m. Um, and that's all until we record next Tuesday. But obviously, hopefully, we'll have a couple more episodes getting ready to go out. Um, yeah, go check us out on YouTube. What's really out there. Um, that's the kind of the platform. Where, uh, you can hear them on all the, the Spreaker, the iHeart Radio, and um, all the big places for the podcast, but we're tr really trying to push the YouTube channel for it right now. We've got uh, 42 episodes as it stands. You can hear most all of them on YouTube. A few of the earlier episodes before we actually got the YouTube channel up are not there, but you can catch them on the uh, Spreaker, iHeart, Spotify, places like that. But uh, for the most part, you can catch just about every episode on YouTube. Um, so... Yeah, go check us out. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Help us out. Help us hit Show that big 500. <laughs> Show them some love. Well, folks, you know, we have had a great time tonight. And uh, we, we all have the show program probably tonight or tomorrow uh, for the coming uh, upcoming show uh, on Saturday. And, again, it will be the last show for two weeks. Uh, I'm going to take my bride out for our 30th anniversary. Uh, we're going we're gonna to spend some time up in Gatlinburg and – and uh, if you guys are going to be at the uh, at the Bigfoot Conference in Gatlinburg, come see us. Uh, like I said, we aren't going to have a booth there. The girls from Blondes and Booze are going to have a booth there. And I'll probably swing by their, their table quite a bit. I'm probably going to put some cards on their table, some business cards. 
but uh, you know, I'll be I'll be around, and I'm per, I'm pretty easy to spot. Uh, look for the look for the 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 heavy set guy with with a cowboy hat on. I'll have one of them on. Uh, yep. I may have the one that, uh, with the uh, band that William made on made for me. I haven't decided yet. I'll probably be right beside him. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah we're, one of us is one of us is, or probably the other one fairly close by. Um, but uh, hopefully Cam Buckner is going to be there. He was saying last time I talked to him that he was planning on coming up just so him and I could actually, you know, hang out and sit and talk for a while. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to make sure I get some good video with the DSLR. Uh, I've got a really good good size memory card in it, so yeah, hopefully we'll uh, we'll be able to get plenty of good video from the DSLR and and uh, and and have some videos to share to the channel and and over to Patreon. Uh, if you want to become part of the Patreon community, check that out over patreon.com slash DA Roberts author. There's a lot of new stuff over there. Hi, new subscriber, Cindy Wendy 65 Hey, welcome to the channel. Thanks for being part of the DAX Maka Nation. Um, but uh, you know, thank you guys for for making making this what it is. We we we're over, you know, we're over five thousand subscribers and growing, and uh, we wouldn't have done any of that without y'all. Uh, we uh, we really enjoy hanging out with y'all. This is just just you know a couple of guys, and, and we, you know we, sometimes we got Doc and and Steve, but uh, and we we like just just having a conversation. Uh, you know, we we may not always have the right answer, uh, but we will try to give you the best answer we can. Uh, again, no experts in this field. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Uh, we're we're sharing what we've learned based on observation, based on data collection, based on you know, eyewitness accounts and personal experiences. Uh, so, you know, take what we what we have to say with a grain of salt. You know, your uh, experiences vary. Different people have had different experiences, and we're not trying to invalidate anyone's. But we're we're the we're the uh, old school old school cops and law enforcement crowd here. We're going to look for the most logical explanation first. If you know we think it's you know doubling back on its tracks, we're going to say so. Uh, you know we're not going to immediately assume it was a portal because we lost the tracks. Uh, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm just saying that that's not going to be our go-to move. We are going to exhaust every possible other explanation before we go to something metaphysical. Um, and that's just the way we approach things. Uh, that's probably going to rub some folks the wrong way. And if it does, I'm sorry, but that's how we do things. And we're not going to change that anytime soon. Uh, so folks, again, thank you guys for hanging out with us. Uh, we have so we have a great time hanging out with y'all. And uh, we look forward to doing it again this Saturday night. Uh, and again, uh, I know I'll reiterate this again. We, uh, we won't be having a show for two weeks, uh, but come see us at the Gatlinburg Convention and we'd love to meet y'all. And uh, hopefully uh, we will see you guys there. But if not, we will see you guys this coming Saturday night. Uh, so. Folks, have a wonderful week. Enjoy the rest of your week. I hope you guys had a wonderful and safe Fourth of July. And uh, you know, let's uh, let's keep our first responders and and uh, law enforcement and military in your thoughts and prayers because God knows they could use it right now. So, yeah, Meg's asking uh, if it twenty six is going to be the return date. Uh, I let me check real quick. I uh, will double check. Oh. Uh, Yes, it looks like the next confirmed show will be the 26th because uh, we will be still meeting Gatlinburg on the 22nd. So and the, the, this coming 12th, we'll still be in town, but it's Noah's birthday and we're going to be out taking him out to dinner and stuff. So we, uh, we our next show will be on the 26th of this month. Month. So hopefully uh, you guys can keep your uh, keep uh, keep things going. We've got a ton of back shows for you guys to, to watch if you haven't haven't watched all of them. And, um, you know, and if not, I'm sure Robbie will keep you guys busy over at uh, What If It's True. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, use that extra time to go check out all those episodes of What's Really Out There. What's Really Out There. So, folks, again, thank you guys for being with us. Thank you guys so much for being part of the DAX Machination. Big shout out and thank you to all the mods. You guys are awesome. You did a great job. We really appreciate each and every one of you guys. And, uh, and you know, folks, we're, we're proud to have each and every one of you as part of the DAX Maka Nation. You guys are awesome. You guys are the best. And we will see you guys on Saturday night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you for joining us. Catch us again Wednesdays and Saturdays on DAX Machina. A special thanks to all our channel members and Patreon supporters. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe.